I would like to welcome you all to this webinar on behalf of the organizing team. This is a third webinar being organized by Life in Petro Academy and Made in It. We have quite a few participants from around the world. Today's topic is ultrasound in subfertility and the overall subject of this webinar is to promote safe and competent use of ultrasound in fertility assessment and treatment. We have three speakers, all experienced in pelvic ultrasound, particularly in the fertility field, Dr. Hippocrates Saris, Dr. Sonal Panjal, and myself, Dr. Jay Prakashan. So to talk about uh, Dr. Saris Ippo, he's a very good friend of mine. He's an Oxford medical graduate, subspecialized in reproductive medicine and surgery, currently leading the King's Fertility and IVF Center, London, as its director. He has lots of practical and research credentials in ultrasound and fertility with many publications. His doctoral research degree from Oxford was on quality control of ultrasound. And he's the chair of British Fertility Society ultrasound study module. So he's going to be moderating the session today. And he's going to speak uh, on a, top, a very relevant topic for the time. In fact, his is one of the first few UK units restarted after COVID lockdown here. And his topic is ART during COVID-19 UK experience. Over to you, Ipo. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for the very uh, kind introduction. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just load my presentation here. And I think it's very important because we're talking about um, uh, ultrasound and uh, obviously about, uh, apologies, I think, uh, make sure I've got the right presentation on. Uh, but you can't really be safe with ultrasound if you're not safe in your uh, all of your practice. COVID is on the... Uh, mind of everybody right now and uh, I thought it was a good, a good idea just to go a little bit of an overview about what's been happening internationally but also to personalize it both to the UK but also what's happening in India as well and uh, uh, to see what one can do if they're operating, not operating or planning to operate within this sort of um, environment and just to keep it a little bit simple I think it's important to understand the nomenclature First of all, we seem to interchangeably refer to COVID, COVID-19, uh, the virus. Effectively, just very simply, COVID-19 is the disease and the name for the disease, which is caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, so the SARS-CoV-2, and that is a group of a coronavirus, which is an, an RNA virus. So actually, COVID-19 is the illness, the disease, not the actual virus itself. And this is, uh, again, just very, very uh, recent, hot off the press. You can see it's just from a few, uh, from two days ago, the data about the total confirmed deaths from uh, COVID-19 um, around the world. Uh, you can see the heat map, uh, which is per million people. And you can see where uh, Indian sits and you can see where the UK sits. Obviously, very, very um, dark. And most of the uh, deaths per million has happened currently um, in Europe. And again, if you look at the, the graphs uh, on the left, you can see a little selection of countries, the ones that have been in the press, like Italy, France, the UK, Germany, but also you can see where India sits and how actually it seems to have a different trajectory compared to the rest of the countries. Uh, and I've put China there just as an indication. Uh, the little blip that you see just down at the corner here is because China um, announced uh, a slightly different way of measuring deaths um, uh, just a few weeks ago, and that sort of brought up um, a little uh, blip. And what is interestingly is in order to know how many cases of um, coronavirus or COVID-19 you have, you first have to test. So there's been a very wide variation of the number of tests that various countries uh, do. So if you look at the number of tests which are happening per thousand population and how it changes uh, over time, you can see that all countries more or less are starting doing more and more tests, but there's a very big um, the variation in the number of tests per thousand population. Again, here is the heat map uh, at the bottom, and you can see again um, where uh, India stands, a little bit light green compared, for example, to um, other parts um, of the world. And again, that is quite obvious when you look at the graphs here. But if you, and effectively that shows, are you only uh, uh, testing people 
who uh, you think they have it, or you're doing a general population screen. So again, interestingly here, you can see a huge variation. So New Zealand is completely off the chart, and that's because they made a decision very early on to test everybody in the entire country, pretty much. And that's why per number of case picked, they have done many tests. And then it goes downwards. And interestingly, despite what you see on the heat signal here, actually, um, India does more tests per case picked um, than the United Kingdom. So, you know, you just have to look at all the numbers sort of in combination. Probably what it means is that the UK is not doing enough tests for the number of confirmed cases um, uh, that they find later on. Uh, and again, what's very relevant to us is not just how many cases and deaths they are, but how are they changing? How quickly are they increasing? Um, and again, uh, this is just a few graphs. You can see it um, on one side, just in general, the entire population, and then it's personalized, uh, or it's, rather it's, it's um, per million uh, on, the, um, on the right side of the screen. Again, because not all countries are the same size. And what is interesting is I can see that most of the countries that have been hit quite hard, like the UK, uh, the United States, China, Germany, Italy, they seem to sort of be plateauing with regards to how many new cases are coming. Uh, India seems to be still on an upward trend. It never seemed to have that same sort of um, acute uh, uh, sort of phase, especially when you look at it per million uh, population, but still it seems to be on the upward trend. And if you want to see if you're sort of bending the curve, if things are getting better or if they're getting worse, you can then look at how many new cases are you getting every day, um, either per million or in total, and uh, how many are you getting um, with regards to what was happening before. And again, if you look at the various sort of graphs, you can see that this sort of curve is being um, bent when it comes down to countries like the UK or the US, and Italy and Germany. Um, again, this blip, here from China is because they re, um, defined how they were counting the cases. Uh, but again, this is interesting from your point of view, is to see that the lines for India, they seem to be on the upward trend and here as well, and they don't seem to be sort of at that stage where the curve is going uh, the other way. Now, of course, it doesn't take into account the fact that a lot of the measures that have been put in place are now being lifted in countries like the UK and the US and Italy. So it'll be interesting to see if there's going to be a second peak and then the curve is going to go upwards again. And again, another sort of interesting uh, graphic way of looking at it is how many daily cases do you have per total cases you have throughout. Uh, and effectively, what you want to be seeing is what's happening in most of these countries here, where you see that case were going up and up, and then the daily cases start going down. You see this sort of kind of drop of your daily cases versus the total cases you've had. Again, India, you can see, is still on the upward that hasn't done the same sort of dip that uh, a lot of the other countries uh, have done. Um, but, you know, deaths from COVID is not necessarily the only way of looking at it because the true cost to life is not just from COVID-19. Uh, uh, specifically in the UK, what happened is after the lockdown, people were not going to hospitals, were not having not just elective treatments, were not having um, treatments for cancer, but interestingly, they were not even presenting uh, with emergency. So anecdotally, I haven't spoken to colleagues of mine, which are uh, cardiologists and uh, neurologists. They were just saying that um, the CCUs and the um, stroke units saw a drop down to 30% of the admissions. So unless you assume that people aren't having strokes or heart attacks anymore, it just means they're not um, uh, presenting. And to look at that as a measure, you can look at what's called the excess death. So how many more people on average are dying than they should die? And you can see that here, this is for the UK, and there's always a lag between measuring the total death versus um, where you are. So the latest data that we have only goes back to just about three weeks ago. And you can see that these lines down here are the average and uh, the spread between the lowest and the highest sort of year, month and month. Uh, for the last five years and you can see a very significant peak here and that peak is more than the numbers that have been reported to be uh, because of um, uh, of COVID uh, and the various estimates of it but it might be 20 or 30 percent more than what um, uh, more excess deaths that we haven't uh, captured so for example we think that UK might have 40 50,000 COVID deaths the excess death might be 60 or 70,000 so unfortunately a lot of that will not be relevant evidently seen until much later, especially if we take into account people that, for example, might not be presenting early on with early signs of cancer, which then might have uh, later on sort of um, um, 
uh, being picked up, which means it'll be more difficult to, to treat. So unfortunately, the legacy of this is going to last for a long time. It's not just the acute deaths right now. I think what's important before one starts to look at how they're going to treat their population, but also you know, what measures they need from infection control, which is what is the top of what we're talking today in this webinar, is also to understand where you sit, not within just the world, but also within your own country. So this is an example of regional variations within England, and you can see, again, when you look at either rates um, of uh, the cases per 100,000 population, uh, or um, the total cases, how they're changing, it's not uniform, there's sort of patches everywhere. And actually currently, it seems, and, and although London was the epicenter of, um, of England, it seems that that sort of has moved down up towards um, the northeast and maybe to the northwest. There was a nice weather here a few weeks ago, so everybody went to the beach when the lockdown was over. It's a place that didn't have any COVID now appears to be having more. And again, you have to see where you are, and, and they're talking now about sort of very, very sort of personalized sort of area and many lockdowns rather than just have one brush for the entire sort of country. That's very important. So that was a little bit of an overview about COVID and where we are, where we are with regards to infections. Very quickly, just to give you our experience to see what are the thought processes and what we went through in order to uh, to see how we're going to deal with it, because that's important and really much transferable, not just for fertility and anywhere in the world, but for any sector. So as uh, Jay very nicely introduced me, uh, I'm the director of King's Fertility, which is effectively a collaboration between King's College Hospital, which is a large NHS foundation trust, and the Fetal Medicine Foundation, which is a charity that does research in fetal medicine. And... Uh, uh, for you that don't know, King's College Hospital is in the centre of, uh, of London. It caters a population of approximately 700,000 uh, people, which doesn't sound a lot, but it's quite a diverse population. Uh, we have 950 beds, and under normal circumstances, 70 ITU beds. Actually, this has surged to 150 now because of COVID, and uh, its uh, turnover is uh, a few billion per year pounds. Uh, and it has uh, quite a few thousand staff. Uh, but actually, I'm next to that uh, little area. This is my building that I work at, and uh, so this first floor here is the entire uh, floor here is the fetal medicine uh, building, and that first floor is the, uh, is the fertility. And why I'm showing you this, because it's relevant when it comes down to thinking how you're gonna restart, is to understand the, the actual um, uh, setup of your clinic and to take advantage of uh, what you can uh, and what you can't. So for example, when I first started uh, in this building here, one of the disadvantages, as you can see, is a very big hole in the middle. So it means we have to walk around. There's a lot of walking. I've been doing lots of thousands of steps every day. It made it a little bit difficult to, to have that sort of kind of close-knit feeling. Now, of course, has a lot of advantages because we're, uh, we can segregate people. So again, you can turn sometimes disadvantages to your advantage according to um, uh, where you are. So just a very quick sort of overview of how everything sort of happened and how quickly it happened. Because I think, interestingly, I think the way that as a fertility field we closed down and in medicine in general was actually very haphazard, almost uh, in a panicky sort of way. You can see that on the 14th of March, both ESHRA and the SRM uh, stated that uh, people should avoid becoming pregnant um, uh, at, at this time with uh, assisted conception at least. Uh, and on the same day at King's Fertility, we um, suspended all the new treatments and the initiation of the new treatments. And um, only two days later, on the 16th of March, we made a decision not to do any fresh transfers or to postpone any frozen transfers. So effectively, even if people were in treatment, they were advised to um, freeze their embryos and not to have a transfer, not to try to be uh, pregnant and um, only a few days later on the 20th of March the UK went into its lockdown. Now some argue it was a bit too late but that's a different discussion altogether and pretty much straight away from a few days later we started working remotely and then on the 23rd of March the um, UK uh, uh, regulating body of fertility, the Human Fertility and Embryology Authority, the HFEA, I came out with a directive that says that all treatments have to stop unless they were for cancer preservation. And uh, because we'd already sort of started it, we stopped all the treatments on the 26th of March. Um, most of the staff uh, stayed at home and we only had a very small amount of skeleton staff that was determined to stay in the unit. And effectively we canceled all in-person sort of contact with, um, with patients. Now, when you do that, it doesn't mean you just shut down, you close, you go home, you go on holiday. Um, of course, there's a lot of things that have to be doing. The, uh, an IVF lab is still uh, it, it's breathing, it's alive, you've got embryos. So, of course, 
Um, we did have to have, and everybody has to have a, a reduced number of staff, but again, you, you look at ways how you can split to make sure they spend the minimum amount of time together. That's currently probably more relevant for places where there still is an upsurge in the number of infections from COVID, as we've seen from the previous graphs I've showed. Uh, and using technology as much as possible. So if you can use remote access for staff to be able to work from home, uh, but also to take advantage of the time to, to, to do something um, uh, for the unit. So we took advantage to deep clean all the incubators, the hoods, the microscopes and the floor. You have to imagine that um, COVID was there before we closed and we didn't know about it. So it was a good opportunity to so do a deep clean and also to try to maintain as much as possible the machinery so you can switch down the incubators and close the gas supplies in order to protect it. Um, and uh, of course, take away any clinical material which is already there or stashed around the clinic, make sure it goes away. Good opportunity to look at your media to make sure everything is still in stock. And obviously, it's very important to check your critical delivery schedule because at least in the UK, there was talk about no drivers, no one can give you equipment or or even bring your gases or even your liquid nitrogen. So um, it was a little bit sort of um, uh, sort of interesting for a few weeks to try to figure out, are we going to run out of liquid nitrogen for or um, uh, embryos, for example? Um, so even if you do have people working, it doesn't mean that they can't do things. So um, uh, the very few that were in the unit or were working from a home, they still have took the opportunity to, to basically go through all of the paperwork and the audits and the and everything that has to be done in the clinic. Uh, we're usually quite a very busy clinic. We do um, about 1,200 uh, egg collection cycles a year, another 500 frozen embryo transfers and a lot of research. So a consequence, uh, sometimes some of these more uh, mundane tasks like uh, uh, auditing um, uh, is left behind. So it's a good opportunity to still do things that had to be done. So it's not wasted time. But most important is also to plan how you're gonna reopen. I think it's important to realize that that's the unit, but you also have patients as well. So it's very important to keep contact with the patients. Um, uh, we use a lot of social media and our website in order to constantly inform them where we are. Small little updates. There's not much you can do when you don't know, especially prospectively, what's happening and when you're going to open again. But that little inf uh, communication goes a, little, a long way. I've got a lot of um, uh, feedback, especially now that we've reopened by staff saying, by sorry, by patients that said they were really thankful of even that little amount of information that they were getting once a week, once every 10 days of saying where we are, what's happening and what our plans are. And of course, we had a link with uh, uh, frequently asked questions, you know, when are you going to start? How are you going to prioritize? You know, will I be able to do X, Y, Z? And a little bit sort of common questions that people had, we just sort of posted on the on the on a website so people can go and look at it. Um, I think it's not just your patients, also your staff. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, fear among uh, not just staff, but people in general. It seems a little bit from my experience up to now, people fall in two camps. The ones that believe that COVID doesn't exist and it's all a hoax. And the people that think that if you just look at somebody, you're going to get it and you're going to die. And there's everything in between. And of course, a lot of it is, is perception and fear and your staff are no different than human as well. So it's about keeping uh, sharing information with them and um, uh, looking at the fears. Fear is not just about our health, it might be about the job, uh, security and, and, and financial as well. And try to do sort of little social things even if it's just remotely, share problems and of course if somebody's unwell just to check on them just from a human point of view to make sure that they're well. Um, so important with everything, it uh, doesn't matter if it's fertility, ultrasound, medicine, is quality control and the processes that you go through. So um, you know, you have to validate all your process, your staff, your equipment, make sure your uh, consumables uh, are all correct and in stock and, and look at your um, environment. And this is a very interesting sort of point when we talk about environments, because actually when it comes down to an IVF unit, we already work in a very, very controlled environment, at least we should. Uh, work in a very controlled environment. And if we're doing ultrasound, for example, we are uh, always looking at infection control as well. So that shouldn't be any different. You know, this is just another virus. Uh, it just happens to be a respiratory virus and, and other issues, but we deal with viruses all the time. So for example, in our lab, we do treat people that have HIV, hepatitis B and C. And um, of course, it doesn't mean that we, we uh, are gonna have any fewer checks than uh, that we would have now. But it's important to know your system. Um, so uh, we look through an entire system to see exactly what um, uh, it can handle. And actually we have an incredibly advanced and expensive system um, which achieves actually category A 
uh, clean air background air, which is much more than you need. I mean, the HFPA specifies it should be category D, um, but our system actually uh, goes to category A. So actually, we're very confident that we're going to be fine from a point of view, an environmental um, uh, infection point of view. And again, when we're talking about uh, maintaining a liquid nitrogen tanks in a choir, um, in a choir room, I think it's important to, to, to try to minimize, especially if there's a, there might be a problem with the supply of liquid nitrogen. So minimize the amount of times you open and close, especially um, if, 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 you, if, if, if you're still doing some work. And uh, uh, of course, uh, what we've also done now is we've actually purchased a new tank, especially for people that might um, be proven to have had COVID uh, at the time of treatment. I'm going to come back to that um, in a moment as well. Uh, but most importantly, and more relevant, I presume now, is what do you do to reopen? So there's a, almost a dead period that you can actually think about what we're going to do to reopen. What are you going to do with your staff, with your patients? Uh, how much um, activity can you do with the new rules that might or might not be in place and with new infection control rules? And actually, a lot of these new processes require training. So you have to have new training and new um, standard operating procedures, and your staff will need to be able to, to be aware of this before they come. Um, and interestingly, also, you need to have agreements with other units, uh, and maybe more so now, when um, uh, to be able to help you if you have a problem. So, for example, if your team goes off sick and you don't have an embryologist, but you still have patients in treatment, who's going to look after them? Um, now, we do have this process in place uh, as a standard in the UK, but what I realized is we were ready to open, but our sister unit was not ready to open. So, actually, I didn't have anybody else. So, we had to sort of all go around and looking at sort of buddies to see who would help you if you needed to. And um, uh, all those are sort of thought processes that you have to go through before, not after you open. Um, and just as, just as an indication, so when we opened, these are the 35 new documents and policies that I had to write pretty much within a week. Some of these are actually 30 to 40 pages long. Um, so everything has to go through your mind to see how you can open in a safe sort of way. So again, Coming now to the reopening bit, so once the UK realized that maybe we're sort of bending the curve, they decided that uh, potentially we can start again. So actually back in April the 23rd, ESHREP um, published its guidelines as to how one can restart uh, fertility treatments. And on the 1st of May, the Secretary of State for uh, the UK, which is Matt Hancock, uh, announced um, that uh, from uh, the 11th of May, fertility treatments can start again. So for us, it was, a, it was a regulatory sort of stop and start. So legally, we couldn't do anything. And obviously, in other countries, it's more, um, uh, it was done by... Um, uh, the the field itself. Uh, what was interesting for us is that we didn't get any warnings, so our patients found out the same time that we did, so pretty much straight away we started getting people calling to say, can I actually start on medication today, which is not exactly what we would have liked to. But in any case, on the 10th of May, our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, uh, uh, announced that the UK can start again business from the next day. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of criticism has, um, uh, uh, has um, occurred in the UK with regards to the fact that there was a lot of uh, uh, you know, talk about doing this, that, and the other, but actually there was no details. So on the 10th of May, uh, which is a Sunday at 7 p.m., they said you can go to work tomorrow, Monday, but then they didn't say how and what measures you have to do. So it was all a bit sort of kind of um, uh, rushed, but at least we knew we could start. So on the 11th of May, the HFEA, at least in the UK, uh, said that, yeah, you can start, but to do that, you need to comply by these 50 different sort of rules that you need to do, and here's an application. Because we've done all the work, it was very easy for us to sort of give all the evidence and to apply, and on the 20th of May, we got our license to restart. Now, again, in typical sort of UK fashion, uh, straight away, uh, the uh, HFEA announced which clinics can start, and pretty much that was before we knew about it. So our patients, because they follow uh, everything that's happening, went on social media to say, excellent, we're restarting. So we found out from our patients that we were able to restart before the regulators told us. But anyway, that's a different story altogether. Um, so when you restart treatment, how do you restart treatment? Well, I think first of all is we all know we're talking about social distancing. We're talking about reconfiguring the clinic. So it's all about expecting how you're going to work. So I literally went around with a tape measure looking around and taping sort of areas and, and making uh, spaces available, changing the seating ar arrangement. But it's important to communicate with patients to manage expectations. Because the government, the Prime Minister on Sunday night said we can go back to normal tomorrow, doesn't mean that's true. So we were having patients calling to say, can I come and start my treatment tomorrow? And the answer is no, you can't. Uh, 
because that's not exactly how we do things. And, you know, by the end of the day, there is some capacity and it's taken us about three or four weeks from reopening to where we are now to be able to slowly catch up. And still we have a couple of more weeks before we can go back to sort of saying, right, now we don't have sort of a, a waiting list. Um, and, uh, you know, for people who've been waiting or had the treatment stopped in March it's not just well it's just another two weeks it's three months plus another month plus another month so for them it's the end of the world and managing that expectation and explaining to them uh, the relevance and how you're going to prioritize one versus the other because in everybody's mind the other priority is very important but if, importantly not everybody should be treated. I mean, there are people that have comorbidities and you need to explain to them why you won't treat them. So I've had people, for example, who had transplants and immunosuppressants calling me to say, can we start? And it's a very difficult conversation to explain to them why you don't want to start treating them now, at least, especially when there's this fear that there might be a second wave. But most importantly, whoever starts and your staff have to follow a certain what we call the code of conduct. How are we going to behave? And how you behave is not just how you behave in the clinic, but how you behave in your everyday life. There's no point sort of being social distancing and using sort of all the uh, sort of, uh, you know, do's and don'ts in the sort of clinic. But in your personal life, you actually, you know, uh, do things which will put you at risk. And if they put you at risk, they put your staff at risk, they put your staff at risk, you put your patients at risk, they put all of the risks. So... When we're looking about sort of staff and, and patient triage, this is what the um, uh, ESHRE has announced about patients and staff and the triage questionnaire and, uh, and testing and not testing. I think we need to go back a little bit back to testing. So first of all, we have to understand testing and you have to understand your test. So PCR, uh, which is uh, sort of the most, uh, well, the way that now um, we detect uh, the infection, is basically a routine test. It's been around for ages and it just replicates very small amounts of DNA for analysis. Now, the problem is that uh, coronaviruses, and of course, then uh, the one that causes COVID-19 is an um, RNA virus. And that is much more difficult and harder to work with, which is why the test, although it's very um, uh, good at picking up uh, the virus, when it, it's a true uh, good test, so it can pick up the virus um, uh, and, and you will know that it is that and nothing else. The problem is a lot of the times you get sort of these false negatives. And what's also important to realize is that although we call it a test, it's not one test. So, for example, we know that in our labs that we use, because uh, constraints, uh, these are international constraints on uh, reagents, it's not the same test that is being used every day. So although they call it a swab or a PCR test, there, there are numerous, numerous tests, and what they will run as a lab will tend to be whatever range they tend to find on, um, on that particular sort of day. And of course, currently we're talking about nasal and throat swabs, which are collected in, um, uh, and, and sent off. And again, it's important is how long have you taken that, that test for? So although it can be stable for a few days, ideally, really, you want to take it and send it straight away. So again, that can change the ability to, to pick up something if, for example, your lab is quite far away, the batch tests and we do it after one or two days. So you have to understand what your test does and what its limitations are before you can understand how you can interpret it and then risk assess your staff and your um, uh, patients. And also, how do you interpret it? Now, it is interestingly that um, it's a very, very complex problem. It's not as simple as, uh, you know, just do a test and it's positive or it's negative. So we know from Public Health England, for example, that the best time to be testing is between uh, day one and five of the onset of symptoms and ideally uh, three days after onset of symptoms. And interestingly, tests that have been done on people who are in ICU, it shows that Although people can be very, very sick, the virus actually is not detectable in the upper respiratory tract. And a lot of the times you have to go deep down into the lungs with um, lavage to be able to find the virus. So it's still infective, it's just it's further down. And of course, people can have uh, be very sick uh, because of the consequences of the infection long after the virus is gone. Um, and why this is interesting is because all of the um, guidelines from ESHRAE, ASRM, or the ones that we use here in the UK, really talks about potentially testing asymptomatic people. So the actual validity of testing asymptomatic people has not been um, uh, clarified, especially with regards to uh, not using it as a population screening to understand what your uh, background sort of prevalences, but if you actually really want to understand the risk of an individual, and that's a very different concept altogether, and we'll come back to the antibodies when we're talking about this. Um, so the new thing that everybody's talking about is serology and antibodies, and of course, there's a lot of promise and hype. Uh, there's a lot of issues with the tests which are out there, and I'll, I, I'll go through some of them, but I don't want to waste too much of your time. But it, effectively, again, you have to understand what they detect. So the incubation period for uh, the virus ranges 
anywhere between one to a day to, to two weeks. And the majority of the cases will actually uh, start having symptoms within the first uh, few days. And the antibodies that um, the body starts producing usually we start from a few days to up to two weeks uh, once the symptoms uh, begin. And there's a very specific IgG antibody which is produced at the later stage of the uh, infection and after the virus itself and the RNA is no more detectable. And the theory is that these persistent antibodies for those that do have them can maybe show that there is some level of immunity. Now we don't know if that's the case and we don't know if everybody mounts these antibodies and how long they last for. Uh, and what is interesting is not just the IgG or the IgM antibodies but we think now that the IgA antibody might be a more reliable way to be able to, um, to look at initial immune response to the virus uh, and IgG potentially shows um, potentially immune to the virus. Now that's again all theory and uh, again you have to understand your test is a two test which at least in the UK have been um, uh, validated. That is one from Roche and one from Abbott. This is the numbers from um, uh, the Roche study. So interestingly, it looks very impressive, and this is specificity. And basically, it tells you uh, if you do find a result which is positive, you know how likely it is that the positives are true positive, and uh, not because of something else. And actually, it's very good. It's 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 um, uh, ninety nine percent, uh, and that sounds fantastic. So it means if you do have antibodies, it's likely that that was because of COVID. However, when we go to sensitivity, there are a lot of limitations here. And again, although initially the numbers sound very impressive or 100% sensitive, that basically means it's what is the likelihood um, of um, if you have a negative result, that that is a true negative and basically it hasn't missed it. But we have to realize it actually changes quite a lot. So from the first uh, one to two weeks, it's actually quite low when, uh, as a test goes anyway. So it can be 65%, 88%, and it says 100% after 14 days. But first of all, look at the confidence intervals. The confidence intervals are quite large because if you look at the number of samples, they looked at only 204 samples of which only 69 were symptomatic patients. So of course, the repeating the same sample from the same person doesn't necessarily mean that it's not the best way of validating this. And what they haven't shown, and it hasn't been published, is how many of these, what was the age range? We know that different age groups have a different ability to be able to mount an immune response. And also what they haven't shown is what stage of the infection it was. I think it's very important, you know, were they very symptomatic, were they very unwell, or were they, were they asymptomatic? Because if we're going now to triaging patients and saying, look, do you have antibodies, yes or no, should I treat you, yes or no? If all of these 69 patients were from people from ITU, for example, that potentially had a very high response to the virus, that might not be necessarily correct for somebody who's asymptomatic. Um, and again, a lot of that detail is being sort of missed in sort of the hype of this test. So although, yes, promising still, uh, uh, their use is, is not necessarily um, where it should be, and we might be overusing uh, or, or trusting too much in these tests. And again, if you look at what happens when you combine PCR and serology, you can see that initially in the symptomatic phase, you start having the virus that you can pick up uh, by PCR, and then afterwards, IgM and IgA will start being produced, and later on, you'll have IgG. But you can see there's actually an overlap between where you can detect antibodies and you still have the virus. So having antibodies and just testing for the antibodies, for example, with the Abbott or the Roche test, which is just IgG, doesn't mean that it's a past infection. It can still be a current infection, or it can be uh, a false uh, negative or a false positive. So... Although it all sounds very promising and we believe in these uh, tests because we know when we have other antibodies that have been validated, like the hepatitis B, C, HIV antibodies, they've been properly validated over years. These tests have are very, very new and in very small samples. So, you know, I think we should take everything with a little bit of a pinch of salt and not trust in these too much. So then we come back to, okay, well, what do we do with the patients and how do we screen them? And this is important not just for IVF, but also for ultrasound. You run an ultrasound clinic, Who's going to come into your clinic uh, and how are you going to uh, approach them? So uh, here what we've decided at King's Fertility uh, and pretty much throughout the UK is that we screen everybody as a questionnaire. And the concept here in the UK is to try to create what's called green zones or, or COVID uh, free areas. So effectively, you're going to have services that are going to be COVID free or COVID light. And you're going to have these services that are basically going to be treating after people that do have COVID uh, or suspected COVID. So the building that uh, my unit is has been designated and we have designated it as a sort of effectively clean or COVID free area. So anybody comes into the building is stopped by somebody who goes through the questionnaire, asks them if they had any symptoms 
takes a temperature, and if there's any issues, they just redirect them uh, away. And effectively, if they do need to be seen, for example, whatever reason, they have to go via the sort of COVID pathway, which is the A and E, the not left, to just come into the unit. So that sort of is your initial sort of phase. And then um, we've sort of decided to be a little bit sort of more aggressive in our testing, mainly because the unit is in the center of, uh, well, it was the epicenter of where um, COVID started. King's College was uh, the first place where um, patients with COVID were admitted and were found to have community spread rather than just um, um, uh, between sort of known contacts. So uh, it was one of the hospitals that had the, the heaviest sort of load of um, patients being treated. So we are testing all of our um, uh, patients before they start the treatment uh, with a PCR test and then before they have their uh, procedure, either it might be an egg collection or that be um, an embryo transfer uh, again so we need two time points where they're negative mainly you could argue you just need one but this is not just like an operation where if you possibly just cancel remember they might have had two weeks of treatment and suddenly you cancel and you could have picked it up before i think it's important to give that stability now interestingly uh, that is not a view which is shared by everybody i'm happy to discuss it afterwards with questions and specifically the HFEA has confused itself and people with what it's advising but that's a, a long discussion happy to have um, uh, later. Um, we might in the future move on to the uh, immune non-immune sort of past infection but having looked at the data despite what is out there the antibodies are not yet there with regards to what they uh, they tell us for us to be able to use that um, uh, on its own. So I think you have to be a little bit more careful. So either you believe that you have to be testing people or you don't. And depending which camp you're in, then either you do it properly or you don't at all. I think doing a half a house uh, sort of approach is probably uh, not worth it. Either do it or don't. Anyway, that's my opinion about things. But it's not just the patients, about the staff. So uh, before everybody comes back, we had to screen them. Now, because everybody was self-isolating, we assumed that they were actually uh, safe. So actually we didn't test them before they came, but what we are doing now is we're testing everybody um, with uh, antibodies. And of course, if they have symptoms, then we will PCR test them, we'll isolate them, let them go home before they come back. Now, one could argue, why am I using antibody tests? Well, good point, because I've just said how antibody tests are not <laughs> correct yet. One of the reasons also a little bit of reassurance to the patient, to the staff, there's a lot of fear when staff comes back. I have about 50 staff that work directly uh, for me and under me and um, their attitude towards the infection is, is very varied and I think sometimes we do things that in order to uh, to uh, have a scientific basis but some of it is also for reassurance so I will put my hand up and say some of it is for reassurance and not necessarily because it's uh, I agree that is the right thing to do. But also, it's, it's giving confidence of what we use. So personal protective equipment, PP, is something that has been uh, very much in the sort of the media for a very long time. It is a precious resource, and I think it's important to use it appropriately. And reassuringly, when it comes down to what we do on a daily basis, actually, we're very low um, risk. So conscious sedation, egg collections, what we do most of the times, are actually not aerosol-generating procedures. So actually, you only need to have all that sort of properly gowned equipment and uh, respirators if you're doing uh, aerosol generally procedures which effectively is when you intubate people if you're going to suction somebody if there's a lot of coughing so most of the things we do do not actually um, generate this sort of kind of risk which then means that if we also handle the entire sort of sequence of what we do body fluids and and and, and the gametes and everything in the appropriate fashion which in any case has part of general infection control in what we do, we do anyway, actually the risk to us and, to the, and from the patient is very, very low. There's more risk between staff to staff rather than patients to staff. Um, and of course, every single step has to be re uh, a risk assessed in order to be able to look at what has to be used. But it's important not just to use it, but know how to use it. Uh, it's amazing how many times I see people wearing masks and they tinker with it, it's underneath their sort of chin, and they, or when they take it off, they contaminate. So we've sort of laminated all the way around the clinic how to properly use protective equipment in order to remind people. Uh, and also you need to train people before they use it, um, how to do it. Um, I always, uh, actually, it was just the other day, I was in the underground, I was laughing because there was someone in the underground that was wearing a mask, a very expensive FFP3 mask, which is under the chin. They were wearing gloves, they were eating a pack of crisps, and uh, then they were licking their fingers uh, from the crisps as well. Uh, I thought, well, it sort of you know, defies the whole point. So, you know, you have to look at it and to look what people do in general, not just, well, here it is a mask and now you're safe. And 
There's a very nice grid that actually the British Philip Societies um, and ARCS sort of guidance has, so you can take it from there. That sort of gives you a little bit of an idea of what you can and can't do. This is slightly adapted one, it's the one we use at our art clinic, and uh, it's a very good sort of visual for people to know what they should and shouldn't wear. But I think the important bit is here. So this is the FFP mask, the ones which are difficult to get, uh, you know, the respirators, they're expensive, but also they're at short supply internationally. And if you see, really, you really do not need to use it almost at all unless you're doing an aerosol generating procedure uh, of which we do hardly any. So we have a small stash aside in case, for example, there needs to be an emergency for an intubation or whatever, touch wood, it's very rare, but uh, it's a small supply. Because you have it, it's important to tell people they don't need to use it all the time because we have responsibility to, to, to protect resources which are, which are scarce as well. Scarce as well. Uh, and then it's just about procedures, about modifying everything that you do. So we literally walk through the clinic and you have to walk through your own clinic and your own practice. May that be ultrasound, a procedure or talking to somebody on the phone or the admin taking payment, doesn't matter what it is. And just do like a little mock sort of uh, a clinic and say, OK, what's going to happen? How close are we going to be? How are we going to do this and the other? And how are we going to modify it? And we almost sort of use this rule, which is 15 minutes uh, and two meter rule, which is trying to keep as many as the contacts, at least without protective equipment, uh, to less than 15 minutes in duration and uh, more than two meters. Because really, even if someone has COVID-19, if you spend less than 15 minutes with them at a distance um, of uh, more than two meters, then you're fine. So it's that sort of close encounter for a long time, which becomes more risky. And at that point, if you think you need to do it, then you should be wearing your protective equipment as well. Uh, so I'm not going to take you through every single thing that we did. It's just a little bit of an example of what we did about looking at chairs, taking them away, making sure they're two meters apart. Interestingly, there's a chat now in the UK that the government might change it from two meters to one meter. There's nothing magic about two meters. In some parts of um, Europe, it is one and a half meters. Others is one meter. Interestingly, it's not the science that changes, is our interpretation of the science that changes. So currently it's two meters, it might be one meter next week, I don't know, but literally you go around with little markings so people have visual where they go. Specifically, I showed you our clinic, we've actually divided into two zones, so it's almost two separate clinics do, doing two separate parallel things with two different sort of um, uh, staffing groups. Uh, and different schedules, so people are, are, are staggered. So if somebody's in the room, the other person will arrive. So if you have two things running at the same time, you don't have two people arriving, let's say, at 9 and at, or at 10. Uh, one arrives at 9, one at 9.15. So although they're there at the same time, they're not exactly arriving at the same time. So these are small little things that we didn't need to do, but we constantly sort of need to think about and see how much we can do from home. We've Most of our interaction are from home. Uh, blood testing kits can be done from home. If not, they just come have the blood test and they go, or the scan and go, or sperm analysis and go, and then we do the consultation as much time as you want over sort of um, a video call like we're doing now. Uh, so trying to constantly adapt everything that you do. And also it's about controlling how people move in the clinic. You know, are you going to have a one-way system? So we sort of instigated this sort of one-way system. It doesn't always work. People do go the other way, but, you know, we do try to sort of to, 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 to make people move in a way that it doesn't actually mean that they will kind of have a lot of interactions uh, between them. We ask people to wait outside of the clinic if we're running late, not to arrive and, um, uh, before uh, their appointment is due, uh, to come on their own, so no uh, you know, other people with them uh, to be waiting or whatever. They all sound harsh, but it's a new reality that we have to live in. And of course, it means that you need more time to do things. So if you have more time, you need sometimes to expand the day to fit more people, but with a lower footprint at any moment in time. So it might be that you shift your staff if you have a, a, a good enough number. Of course, it doesn't matter if you work if you only have one person, but if you do, then you can actually shift the way that they work. So they overlap for the minimal amount of time and they spend more time um, alone. And also trying to get people not to spend too much time together. And it sounds very harsh, but it's not a social club, it's work. So although we all like congregating together in common areas and chit-chatting, I think it's important to say you have to stay at your workstation, in your office, do your work, don't come around, disturb everybody. Um, it's not our nature as humans to, to, to do that, but again, we have to adapt, especially while this is all happening. And 
It's all about good hygiene, constant cleaning before, after you do anything. Use only your workstation. Don't sort of hot desk and go around. Use your protective equipment as and when required. Um, and if you have lots of people, you do need what's called these social distancing champions going around telling people just to have good behavior. And the first few weeks when I started, it was me going around like sort of a demented person, sort of telling off people why they're not doing what they're meant to be doing. The police are there to be followed, not just to be read. Uh, and again, timings of every procedure. How long is it going to take to do your ultrasound? So we used to do them every 15 minutes, now it's every 30 minutes, we might go to 20 minutes, same thing for the egg collection, same thing for our transfers. How many people are inside? Usually we'd say it could be you and your partner, now it can be taken, it only has to be the, 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 the patient and not the partner. So little sort of things just to move things away from how we used to do them to how we're doing them now to be able to still do your job but complying with all the sort of the, uh, the, the, the distancing and the, and the issues and the sort of um, uh, footprint that we, we, we need to sort of um, do to be able to do a job safely for us and for our patients. Um, so again, that goes everywhere. It goes from the lab, it goes from the nursing team, the admin team. Um, and again, just to give an example of knowing what your lab does, we know, for example, that our um, air handling unit does 20 changes uh, of air uh, every hour, and that's enough to reduce any sort of virus, even if you don't have your filters, to less than 1%. So knowing stuff like that means you can reassure your patients uh, and yourself and your staff that actually you are in a very safe environment. It's more unsafe to be outside of the unit than to be inside the unit. And uh, again, you have to risk assess if you have a cryo lab, how are you going to freeze them? Are you testing people before? If you're not testing, how do you know there's not going to be any contaminations? There are always going to be people that are going to come through with the infection that you didn't know. Um, and again, you need to think about it and, and use what is right for you and for your setting. Uh, and importantly, if you change your process, you need to make sure it works and to validate it. Sometimes it's more dangerous to change than something not used to rather than keep the old setting that you had. Uh, and again, before you start, make sure everything is working, make sure you've got your gases, your air system, your liquid nitrogen, everything has been serviced and validated. We were effectively not doing any work for almost two months. Doesn't mean that you just turn on the key and everything works again. Everything has to be tested once more. And I think the final thing to say, it's all about being prepared, risk assessing. It's about looking at your local environment, knowing your tests, knowing your population, knowing your patients, knowing your staff, seeing what the fears are, reassuring, but at the same time, listening to them, constantly advising um, what needs to be done, altering your processes and, and, and being open-minded and adapting. So we're constantly adapting what we do. Uh, our first day collection was not like the same like the second and the third and the fourth because we constantly tweaked things as we went along. So obviously, I think when we think about how we used to be, this is actually just Christmas. This is a Christmas party. This is my team. You can see we're all very happy. We're all sort of hugging each other. And uh, this is how we are living now. And this is my team just a couple of weeks ago, uh, ready to start and see um, our patients. So it's a new way of doing things, um, but it's actually um, uh, doable. And if anybody has any particular questions, I'm happy to share, to talk, and to uh, sort of explain your experience. As I said, it's been our four weeks that we've been open and it's been definitely um, uh, an eye opener, but it's doable. So uh, yes, I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to move on to the next talk. So obviously, I'm going to, we're going to take all the questions at the end because we thought that would be best and then everybody can then... Um, good. So what we're going to do is we're going to move completely now um, tact of what we were talking about. So I gave you an overview about COVID uh, and how to stop, start and restart uh, treatments. Of course, we talked about fertility, but that goes for any sort of uh, medical field. But now we're going to go back to what we were sort of talking about, which is more sort of specific about um, ultrasound. And uh, I know that um, Jay and Dr. Jay has actually already uh, spoken. He hasn't introduced himself. He actually is... Um, uh, a uh, phenomenally uh, accomplished um, uh, doctor in, in, in ultrasound. I actually had the pleasure of um, meeting Jay for the first time. We were both, I think, research fellows. Is that correct? I think that is correct. And we were both doing our research and presenting at um, conferences. He always had the better papers than me. I was always very jealous of all the work that he did. And obviously that has now followed him throughout his um, career, being himself um, of course, a consultant um, gynecologist and not some specialist in uh, reproductive medicine um, and surgery, but specifically with a, with a great interest in ultrasound. 
he uh, he's published numerous papers in his committees and he's in a, uh, an associate professor uh, at the University um, of Nottingham and uh, somebody who's had the pleasure to uh, listen to a lot of his talks about ultrasound. They're always very educational and very, very uh, thorough. So what um, Dr. Jay is going to talk about, he's going to talk about um, the baseline assessment in subfertility of ultrasound, the techniques and the diagnostic principles. I think why that is very important is it doesn't matter if you know how to scan really, really well and use all the techniques like Doppler 3D and, and whatnot. If you don't understand the basics, then you can't get the advanced. And uh, sometimes revisiting the basics means that you can then uh, become better uh, and get little tips as to how to optimize what you do. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll uh, uh, let um, Dr. Jay start his presentation. Thank you, Ipo. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Um, so we all know that ultrasound is absolutely an essential tool uh, in fertility, and that is uh, for various reasons. So we do use ultrasound as a baseline investigation to rule out any uterine or admixed pathology, which might be uh, detrimental for fertility, not only just for conceiving, but also for pregnancy point of view, because some of some of the uterine pathologies could increase the risk of miscarriages. And then, of course, over the last 10-15 uh, years, we have uh, got the concept of uh, assessing the ovarian reserve as a matter of predicting fertility and, and choosing the uh, the treatment protocol. And obviously in an IVF unit, we also look at whether the ovaries are accessible because that information is quite important for uh, collecting uh, the eggs and for monitoring uh, and also for uh, surgical procedures. And the monitoring will be covered by SOMAL. And we have various ultrasound methods, conventional 2D technique, and then we can use the 3D if we have got the machine integrated onto that. And we use Doppler, the pulse wave Doppler, coming with 2D uh, scan. So we specifically looking at a single vessel and looking at the velocity waveforms. And also we can look at using a 3D power Doppler angiography. We can look at the whole vascularized, vascular, vascular information within the region of interest that we are looking. And we can use the contrast, for example, a simple saline. We can use uh, uh, to do a saline infusion on histography to evaluate the endometrial cavity. Uh, and also uh, the contrast to look at the fallopian tubes, high cosy technique. And as uh, Ipo mentioned, and I think, you know, we thought we probably will start with some basics. I know they, um, uh, I'm hoping that there will be some uh, people who are uh, learning ultrasound at this point, and also people who are doing a lot of scans as well. It's probably best to remind ourselves. And the first and foremost is we have to be familiarizing with the machine. So, you know, the, 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 nowadays the console with the, starting, the start button is like a computer. So you press on the button and you need, we need to familiarize with all the buttons. Uh, so, for example, even if uh, uh, we have been scanning for a long time, just in case that a new machine comes, and it might be probably a, a bit embarrassing, like, you know, we are looking for certain things and we can't find, especially when the patient is around. And once we know, the, when we start scanning, we need to be obviously choosing the ultrasound probe that we want. And then subsequently, we have to look at the way that we need to display on the screen. So I'm sure uh, in the participants, you know, many people will be uh, using this one and some, of, uh, some others will be using all these ways. And I'm sure uh, all those who are uh, scanning will be familiarizing with how we can adjust. And obviously, the, there's always, uh, I, I'm not sure whether this is clear, but this is uh, GE, Wallison, uh, and usually the companies advertise by saying that this is a sort of indicator where the where, where, where indicator mark. And what this means is, so basically, once we get the transvaginal scan, and we need to see the top portion of the, the, the probe, which, where, it, where does it indicate? So when you are making it like this, you put a bit of gel and you can see it is at the uh, superior portion of the probe and you will see the gel here. So we know that the upper portion of, uh, up, the structures which are in the upper portion will be uh, on the right uh, side of the screen. And to elaborate a bit further, we have to be orienting, uh, we have to be aware of the image orientation. So for example, if you're doing a transvaginal scan, and I'm sure um, um, all of us would be familiar with this, uh, a small knob or a depression where you place the thumb. So we hold the transvaginal probe um, like this. And then when we are using this, uh, um, uh, this is uh, uh, basically to evaluate the uterus in a longitudinal plane. 
and then you turn the probe 90 degree anti-clockwise to evaluate the uterus uh, uh, transverse in a transverse plane. So here, just to reiterate again, the image orientation as you see here, this is an anti-verted uterus, and this mark is the one where it is indicating the top portion. And therefore, in an anti-verted uterus, the fundus will be in the upper part compared to the cervix, which is in the lower part. So we are seeing the upper part, that is a fundus on the right side of the screen and the cervix on the left side of the screen. Whereas this is a retroverted uterus, and you can see here, here in a retroverted uterus, the cervix will be in the upper part, whereas the fundus will be the lower part. So you are seeing uh, the cervix on the left side of the screen and the fundus on the right side of the screen. And whereas with the transverse plane, there is no confusion. So basically that this side is always patient's right and this side is patient's left. And if you're using a, an ultrasound probe, again, there is a probe or orientation mark here. So that is where when you're holding, you can always use our thumb as an indicator. So the thumb is directing towards that probe, your, or, or probe or orientation marker. So if you're scanning like this, see the uterus, the upper portion of the uterus, that's a fundus, and that is on the left side of the screen. Now, then the next thing is we have to be getting the best possible image that we can use. And the, the five key things that we'll be looking at is scan angle, depth, focal point, gain, and frequency. I'm sure there are quite a few other uh, buttons as well, but I think you know these are the sort of the basic buttons that we'll have to be familiarized with. So first of all, when we start the scan, we always start as a sort of a, um, um, an overall view, so a panoramic view. So you start with increasing the uh, scan angle and um, some most machines will give about 120 degree, whereas this machine is giving about 180 degree. So you keep it wide to begin with. And then once we have the scan, we are focusing on this cyst. So we reduce the scan angle. So reducing the scan angle always improve the, improve the resolution because the ultrasound wave is a bit more focused. And as you all know, the axial resolution is always better. The axial resolution is uh, at the middle, whereas the lateral resolution, that means on either side, it will be lesser, the resolution will be lesser. So we are focusing on this. So this is an axial resolution. So you're narrowing the uh, scan angle and then you're increasing the depth. And increasing the depth, basically making the image uh, bigger and uh, making sure that at the, the, the structure that we are looking at is occupying around two thirds of the screen so that we can evaluate a little bit more better. And then looking at the focal point. So you can see here as a couple of examples here. See the focal point is here. You can see the asterisk and the, 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 the um, uh, structure the, at the focal point, the resolution will be better. So here, for example, like the uh, focal point has made a little bit up. So see here, even assume this is probably more of a cumulus cells you know, in a follicle, and you can see the cumulus cells uh, better than this picture where the focal point is more closer to the structure that you're looking at. And then the gain, so you increase the gain or decrease the gain, so making it brighter or, um, uh, or uh, making it blacker. So, and that is more to the convenience uh, of, of the examiner, but generally, you know, for example, like, you know, if you're doing a high cosy because you're using a contrast, so it is probably best to keep the image a bit more blacker uh, rather than making the gain higher and it become whiter. And the other thing is choosing the frequency. Of course, that you know when we're doing a transfusion scan, there's only one frequency, but it has got a bit of um, uh, a range. And the machine itself, I mean, some of machines like this itself has got three options of normal resolution and penetration. So you use the sort of a normal and the resolution will give a bit more a better picture if you can go close to the structure that you want to look at. But you may have to use a penetration, for example, if the ovary is a bit higher up in the pelvis, then it is best to use a penetration so that, you know, with the penetration mode, that means a lesser frequency mode, the ultrasound wave, the wave will penetrate better and that gives a bit more better quality image for the, uh, for the uh, deeper um, uh, structures. Uh, and also similar for the fibroids as well. So, for example, fibroids, there's the ultrasound wave attenuate. So it is best to use a penetration mode to have a bit more better view of, uh, of the fibroid. And then looking at the movement, and I already alluded to about the rotation. So you see, you hold the probe, uh, with generally we keep the thumb at that at the top portion so that you know even, you know, you don't have to look at it, or you, obviously with experience it comes. So you hold the probe like that and you rotate it 90 degree anti-clockwise, never clockwise, it is anti-clockwise for longitudinal scan and a transverse scan. And then you can angle, you know, it is not always just this 90 degrees. Sometimes you may have to angle the probe. So see the ovary is always a bit of oblique uh, at the um, iliac um, uh, uh, pelvic side wall. So you have to probably make it a bit oblique and angled 
to see the ovary in a longitudinal plane. And then you can withdraw the probe or advance the probe. Obviously, you need to do it gently after, after having a wrapper with a patient uh, to make, uh, not to make any discomfort. And this is sometimes very useful as well. So for example, you, know, you may have to do a bit of uh, sliding movement to confirm that there is no sort of adhesions. And also sometimes when, for example, like comparing cesarean scarlet topic versus a miscarriage, which is happening, you know, the, the, the pregnancy is in the lower uh, cervical canal or lower uterine cavity, does then you, you do a bit of sliding. And if it's a pregnancy, which is miscarrying, usually slides, whereas it's a cesarean scarlet topic, it will be stuck. And the other key thing is, you know, that is something that I, when I started scanning, you know, I wasn't getting a good quality image. And one problem that I noticed was I'm not making a good contact with the structure that we are looking. So here you can see, this is where the probe is in the vagina. And that is just at the, you know, at the uterus. So see the quality of the image is so good because the probe is actually touching the uterus. And as I said again uh, earlier, because we need to be, um, absolutely gentle with our movements because we won't want to make um, uh, uncomfortable to the patient, but make it gently and gently press onto the structure that we will have to look at, and that gives a better quality image. And that's the advantage of the transvaginal scan because it's a higher frequency probe and therefore giving a good resolution. And the other basic principle, again, sometimes we do tend to forget about is the history taking. You know, we'll have to ask the last menstrual period so that that will give us an idea about certain pathologies can be uh, diagnosed better in the early, uh, in the uh, first half of cycle uh, and, or for, and for some in the second half of cycle. And also whether the patient is taking hormones or uh, any previous surgery. So there are occasions where, you know, some of senior uh, um, uh, clinicians have actually seen an ovary where the ovary was removed and it is always sort of we see what the mind interprets or mind thinks isn't it so you need to ask about the previous surgery and also even you know like cesarean sections so people who have had cesarean section especially more than one generally we do tend to struggle to find the uterus because uh, find to um, uh, to evaluate the uterus because the uterus tend to be more axial and also making sure that whether the patient has had previous imaging, it is not like coffee, but it is best to understand whether they have had any previous imaging. And also in case if there was a pathology, we can compare that. Um, and then of course you always like, you know, you uh, pr be prepared to use both hands, you know, like a bimanual part patients. For example, when we are scanning the ovaries high, so we may have to probably use your left hand to press on the tummy to bring the ovary um, a bit low. And same thing with the fibroid as well. And we are starting the ultrasound scan, transvaginal scan to begin with, and always adopt a systematic approach. There are at times where we see a cyst and we go behind the cyst, and then we forget to evaluate the rest of the structures. So it is always, even if there is a pathology that is, is absolutely there, still it is best to adopt a systematic approach. And as soon as the transvaginal probe is at the introitus, you start looking at the screen. And the anatomical landmarks that we'll have, look at the urethra. See, always urethra is likely to be seen because there will be a bit of fluid, a bit of urine in the um, urethra. The vagina will be, or there will be a bit of hyperechoic structure. This is mainly the air bubbles because obviously between the air, uh, vaginal walls, there'll be some sort of air bubbles and that will be seen as a bright echogenic area and you will be seeing the, uh, the, the um, um, anal, canal, uh, anal canal muscles. And the other thing is, you know, if you follow the vagina, you always land up in the anterior phonics. And that is the right place to land, you know, or to keep the probe so that you will see the cervix quite clearly. And then you look at the endocervical canal um, and then you follow the endocervical canal if the uterus is antiverted. So as you can see here, the, the uterus is antiverted. So you follow the probe uh, anteriorly and upwards so that you will see the rest of the uterus. See, this is an example where if when we are passing the probe and it is gone directly into the posterior phonics and see when how many times when we start scanning, you know, how many times we landed up there and we can't see where we are. And if we are landing up here, if the probe is in the posterior phonics, we won't see anything. And if that is the case, just withdraw the probe a little bit and then see the cervix and then go to the anterior phonics. So then you see the cervix and then follow um, um, as we discussed just now. I'm going to show you a couple of videos on that. So um, we are starting scanning. The probe is uh, held like this, longitudinal. See, as soon as the probe is at the introitus, you're going to look at the screen. You can always see the urethra and the bladder base and then the cervix. So you land up in the anterior phonics. That's the right place to land. This lady has had a C-section before. So once you're doing, then you move the probe sideways, right to left, left to right. And it is a sort of a sense that, you know, we evaluate the uterus first. 
uh, and then moving on to the ovaries and adnexa. So then you do, and making sure that the structure that you're looking always disappears. So for example, when you're looking at the uterus, go beyond the uterus because there might be a pedunculated uh, fibroid or it could be a, 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 a uterus tidal phase, who knows? So it is making sure that, that the structure that we are looking is disappearing. So there isn't anything, any abnormality outside. And then once this is done, then you turn the probe anti-clockwise uh, anti 90 degrees, so turn the probe, and then you evaluate the uterus in a transverse plane. And again, you move up and down and making the uterus disappear, go beyond the structure and then come back. Then um, when you're looking at the ovaries, uh, those who are the beginners, you know, one thing that you'll have to bear in mind is it's always think about uh, like a shoulder of the uterus. For example, you know, imagine ourselves. So the head is like the, fun, the, the, the fundus and then the shoulder. And that is where the fallopian tube starts. And same thing for the uterus. You know, the, you go up and you see the fundus, you come down a little bit and you see the shoulder where sometimes you may be able to see even the infundible power portion of the fallopian tube. But generally, you know, you see the broad ligament of the tube. Normally you won't see the tube as such, but you will see the structures, the blood vessels, and the, you know, part of the broad ligament will be seen as shoulder here on either side. And once you see the shoulder, you follow that shoulder. And I know this, the, 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 the video that I'm going to show is a stimulated, you know, it's an IVF cycle, so it is easy to see the ovary. See here, the, you see the shoulder there, and then you go to the side. And then once you're on the side, you should be ideally seeing the ovary and you can move the probe in that angle. That means in the transverse um, um, direction and you move the probe up and down and you see the ovary. And once you see the, that side, then looking at here, See, you're going to the other side, and then again, more or less at the same level, but again, you identify the shoulder, and iliac vessel is another landmark, you know, for identifying the ovary, because normally uh, the ovary will be sitting just medial to that. And uh, just to show you the normal sized ovary here, see here the uh, uterus going up, find the shoulder, and the ovary is actually a little bit lateral, and then you're following, and then here comes the ovary. And always make sure that when you're seeing the ovary, it is always kept in the middle here. And as I said, you know, axial resolution is better here. So you keep that in the, in the middle portion uh, of, of, um, of the scan uh, picture. That's a sort of a basics about uh, the scanning. And now let us look as a sort of baseline investigation to look for uh, various pathologies. So first of all, um, uterus, uterine anomalies, let us deal with it. Uterine anomalies have become more and more um, picked up nowadays, and there is evidence that uh, it can increase the risk of adverse outcome. But having said that, we'll have to bear in mind, most women with congenital uterine abnormalities experience normal reproductive outcome, although there is an increased risk of adverse outcome. And there is control studies that show that uh, hysteroscopic septal division reduces the risk of miscarriage. So it is uh, important that we diagnose uterine anomalies, and the gold standard for diagnosing uterine anomalies is um, seeing inside as well as seeing outside. So a combination of hysteroscopy and laparoscopy. So you all agree that this is a normal uterus, whereas here there is a septum. And if you're seeing the external condor as normal, then it is likely to be a septate uterus, whereas in this uh, group, it will be biconate uterus. Whereas here you can see only one uh, osteo, so it's a uniconate uterus. And for uterine anomalies, the one key aspect is looking at the transverse plane. So here, see the bottom uh, picture, bottom video. So you see, I'm sorry that it is a bit um, uh, slow, jerky movement, but make sure that you know, you're looking at the endometrial echo. And the endometrial echo is always single, and you can see the, both the shoulders on either side as well, uh, shoulders of where the fallopian tube starts. So you're seeing a single endometrial echo, and with both the shoulders are seen, that means it is likely to be a normal uterus. And I'll show you another image, another video here. And in this, uh, you have to carefully look uh, when you're seeing in a transverse plane, the endometrial echo. So that's a longitudinal scan, uh, moving sideways, and you turn the probe, and you see the endometrial echo. And when you're going to the top of the uh, uterus, see here, you might see it, it is dividing into two just now. And that is basically that the endometrial echo is divided by the myometrium in between. Now we're doing a 3D scan, that's a 3D sector. You're expanding the 3D sector to enclose the whole of the uterus in a mid-sagittal plane of the uterus and you press the 3D button and it sweeps through and then you see a, a, a multiplanar view automatically. 
and see here that's a longitudinal plane, transverse plane, and a coronal plane, which is very unique for 3D. And you see here because you can see a small dip, and that is why when you're going, when you're doing a transverse plane, when you reach at this place, you're seeing these two endometrial echoes divided by this middle and the middle uh, myometria. And see, that's more evident here. See. The endometrial echo is completely divided into two, the, divided by the myometrium, and see it's a complete septate uterus with a normal external condyle of the uterus, whereas the myometrium or the musk cell is completely going down up to the cervix and dividing that endometrial echo into two. Um, uh, and this is even further, like you know, this is a 3D coronal, 3D uh, multiplanar view, a longitudinal plane, transverse plane, and a coronal plane. And see when you are familiar with, uh, if you are familiar with the 3D uh, images, see this is the coronal image, and you see a dot, and that is corresponding to each uh, at this exact similar point in all three planes. So you are having a longitudinal plane at this level, and that is what you are seeing here. And you can see the distance from the top of the endometrium to the serosa is a little bit longer. Uh, so, for example, because you are doing, you are having a sagittal plane at this level, and if your if your probe is moving up a little bit, and then the distance from the top of the endometrium to the serosa will be lesser. And if you are having a coron, if you are having a transverse plane, that means you are having a cross section at this level, and that is what you are seeing here: two endometrial echo and divided by the myometrium. So, the two D itself will give us some idea about yes, there is a uterine anomaly. So, if you are seeing a, a, a two endometrial echo, it, may, it if it is very subtle, if it is seen only at the top portion, it will be a, just an arcuate uterus or a subtle subseptate uterus. But if you are seeing that the whole the way through, then it is likely to be a complete septate uterus. And in biconate uterus, you will see two endometrial echoes, but they are mostly widely apart it's because biconate is always divergent, and you will see it's a far apart. So just to recap, although I've gone through some of the basics, and just to uh, uh, let you know about the 3D technique, uh, 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 where you always have to, when you scan the uterus, you have to get a mid-sagittal plane to begin with uh, before starting the 3D uh, uh, record or 3D uh, button, pressing the 3D button. So you have the uterus completely, you know, occupying two thirds of more than two thirds of the screen. So you have a good quality image. Uh, occupying more than two-thirds of the screen, mid sagittal plane, you press the 3D button and it gives you a sort of 3D sector that completely encloses and once you press it, then you get a uh, multiplanar view. And when you have the multiplanar view, there are three buttons that you'll have to play with, X, Y, Z. And X, Y, Z is actually rotating the image in three different, three per perpendicular planes to have uh, the uterus uh, or the coronal plane will be seen something like this, where you can see the infundibular portion of the, both the fellow being in the same plane. And once you have that, you open the, or you press the rendering box. So the rendering box will be coming in with a green line at the top, and you narrow it down. If you are narrowing that uh, rendering box, the image will be a bit more crisper. And then making sure that the green line is at the level of the endometrium. And see here, because it is at the level of the endometrium, you can see the uh, coronal, uh, the rendered image uh, much crisper, much clearer. And uh, for diagnosing uterine anomaly, ideally you have to see both the infundibular portion of the fallopian tube uh, in the same plane. It is not ideal. I mean, obviously we'll be showing only the good quality image here on the screen, but you know there are occasions where we won't be, but, but that is a sort of an ideal image that we'll have to get. So the 3D ultrasound, because of its um, ability to show us a coronal view, we will be seeing the uterus, the, a, its external condor and internal condor, and therefore now this is a gold standard for diagnosing uterine anomaly. We don't need to do a, an MRI, we don't need to do a combination of laparoscopy or a hysteroscopy diagnosis. 3D ultrasound is the diagnostic um, um, investigation. Uh, so that's a normal uterus, that's an arcuate uterus, you can see the normal external condor, this is a subseptate uterus, you can see the normal external condor, whereas the internal indentation is going down, but not up to the cervix here, it is up to the cervix, so it's a complete septate uterus, and this is a biconate uterus, so the external indentation you can see compared to here. And also you can see the divergent uterine horn, so it's wide apart. So that is what I said about when we are doing a 2D scan, 2D scan is good enough to screen for uterine anomaly. So those who have not have a 3D machine, uh, you can still screen for uterine anomalies 
once um, you're very familiar with, familiarized with uh, the technique for diagnosing epigenome anomalies. So because when we are doing, you will see the two endometrial echo, but far apart, and it, because it is divergent. And unicornate uterus, if you have got a 3D, it will be easy. But when you're doing a 2D scan, you will still see only a single endometrial echo, but you will see a sort of a beak sign because you know when you're going up to the top, you won't see both the shoulders. You will see only one shoulder, and that shoulder is also deviating to one side. And then you will be have feeling that yeah, there's some sort of problem there. And then the T-shaped uterus. And if you're diagnosing a unicornate uterus, always make sure that we are looking for a rudimentary horn uh, because that um, can be seen uh, in some occasions. And you can see if you're putting a Doppler on, you will see um, you will see the uh, continuity of the the Doppler signals. And always, if there's a uterine anomaly, always look for in the renal abnormalities by doing a renal scan, because around 18% 18, uh, 18 of uterine anomalies can be associated with uh, urinary uh, uh, tract abnormalities. And most common one is a unilateral renal agenesis. And this is uh, an example, as I'm showing, that when you're scanning, you go beyond the structure that you want to scan. See here, you saw the uterus, and you're going beyond, and there comes the other one. So that's, although it is very rare, but that is something where you may sometimes come up with seeing a uterus didelphis. And you can see on the 3D image, because the 3D has got some limitations because you can't get the, over the whole, uh, both the uterine bodies in the single image. And that is the reason why we are struggling to show both the uterine bodies in the single, single plane. And um, the... Uh, uh, H-ray, ESG, I'm not going into detail about the classification, but the H-ray has come up saying that, you know, you can actually diagnose or uh, classify uterine anomalies based on the uterine wall thickness. So you draw a line along the, uh, along the uh, infradivular portion of fallopian tube, and then you parallel line, and then you look, you have a measure of the uterine wall thickness. And if your internal indentation, so you draw a line along the tube or the infundibular portion of the open tube, draw a line parallel, and that is your uterine wall thickness, and you draw a line at the bottom of the indentation. And if this distance is more than 50% of the uterine wall thickness, then that is a septate uterus. And if the internal indentation, exactly the same, if the internal indentation is more than 50% of the uterine wall thickness, it's a bicorporeal. They changed the term from bicornate to bicorporeal. But having said that, this has been criticized uh, um, by many experts, mainly because, you know, uterine wall thickness is not a sort of a, a, a relative measure that you can rely on. For example, like fibroids or adenomyosis, uterine wall thickness can be higher. Uh, and instead, and that is what we follow as well, like, you know, drawing a line there at the fallopian tube level, and then you measure this depth and if it is more than 10 millimeter that means a centimeter then it's more of a septate uterus which can be uh, clinically relevant and uh, there is evidence that the 3d ultrasound is the diagnostic um, um, cho method of choice now for diagnosing uterine anomalies moving on to fibroid uterus that is the other uh, very common pathology that we do come across and we have to uh, diagnose fibroids and precisely to know where about the size of fibroid and where exactly it is located and in relation to the endometrium so fibroids generally seen because it's obviously the myometrial swelling isoechoic so the the echogenicity will be more or less similar to the myometrium, but it is likely to be a, there is a clear margin. And that is how you distinguish from adenomyosis, because adenomyosis, there isn't any sort of possible clear margin. It's a well-defined, smooth outline. World appearance is more of a pathological uh, description, but very occasionally you may be able to see uh, in scan. And this is where I said about, you remember that I said about applying penetrative mode, because one problem is the ultrasound waves, because it being a solid structure, the ultrasound waves attenuates, it becomes weakened, and therefore you use a bit of penetrative mode to see. And even you can see here the anterior border is clearly seen, whereas the posterior border is not clearly seen. Uh, and that's the difference. And you may be able to see sometimes posterior shadowing as well. And you may occasionally have to use a transabdominal scan and abdominal pressure to bring the, bring the fibroid down closer to the transvaginal probe. And sometimes you do see it with a calcification around, and then you may see a bit of hyperechoic uh, rim around the fibroid. Submucous fibroid, you diagnose a type 0 completely inside, and type 1 is um, more than 50% inside the uterine cavity, and type 2 is less than 50% in the uterine cavity. And this is an example of showing a submucous fibroid. You see there, it's a uh, longitudinal scan. And majority of time, if you want to map the fibroid, the uh, transverse view is the key. Because the transverse view, you will be able to see whether it's anterior, posterior, right side, or left side. 
So you can see there's a fibroid here, which is at the top uh, portion of the uh, uterine cavity on the left ankle. And uh, the three, uh, and if you put Doppler on, you, be, you would be able to see a semicircular or circular um, rim of blood flow. And the 3D may help, and that this is just showing an example of the 3D scan where you see precisely where the submucous fiber is. And from the mapping point of view, um, one, I'm sorry, I just wanted to show you the fibroid mapping. So it is sometimes easy to draw a picture like this. See here, uh, this is where when the fibroids are, the image quality is extremely poor. You apply the penetrative mode, you do an abdominal scan. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if you have multiple fibroids, it's always best to come back to the basics, how the uterus is, and then you mark the fibroids by drawing a picture like this. And always remember, that, you know, again, the um, landmarks, like, you know, the bladder base, uh, the uh, anterior phonics, and the endocervical canal, just in case if you are lost because of uh, multiple fibroids distorting the uterine cavity. Endometrial polyp is um, relatively easy to diagnose. So gen the ideal time for um, uh, doing a scan for endometrial polyp is in the first half of cycle where you will be seeing the endometrium at trilaminar. And when this midline echo is lost, then it is like there is likely to be a polyp. And the polyp, especially in premenstrual women, it will be like a hyperechoic because of the mucus. And if you apply a Doppler, you'll be seeing like a feeder vessel and you would be able to apply, uh, uh, sorry, apply a saline infusion sonar histography here. So uh, uh, I use a simple IUI catheter inserting without any balloon and instill some saline. And if you've got a 3D, actually you could take a 3D sweep uh, quite quickly. So you don't have to push the fluid for a long period of time, um, but within a 15, 20 seconds, you will be able to get a 3D sweep and you can go back and manipulate uh, that, those images. Uh, and then you can um, make a virtual uh, image there. See here, the, you can see the endometrial cavity it is not very clear, but putting some saline will make uh, much better uh, visualization of the endometrial cavity. And this is an example of a 3D saline sonar histrography. So here you can see um, there is a small polyp there at the top of fundus, and you may you will be able to see again coronal plane. So 3D may help in terms of having a bit more better. Uh, pictures and precisely locate where the fibroid is. This is an example of a, 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 a polyp which is completely occupying the uterine cavity and if you're applying the Doppler, I feel a vessel there. Uh, you may be, and I tend to use um, uh, ultrasound guided operative procedures, and this is a lady who actually had a hysteroscopy and unfortunately perforated and had bowel injury, and then we had to take that lady for a repeat poly 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 polypectomy and had to use uh, uh, an ultrasound uh, guided procedure just to make sure that you know there's nothing, no complications from that perspective. Moving on, adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is um, um, a histological diagnosis, but the ultrasound gives a sort of a clue where the uterus is globular enlargement, anteroposterior asymmetry, as you can see very clearly. And if you're looking at other features, see here the heterogeneous myometrium. And adenomyosis will be a bit more clearer when you're doing a scan in the second half of the cycle, because in the second half of the cycle, the endometrium will be brighter, and the same way, the endometrium within the myometrium will be brighter. And you will be able to see the parallel shadowing, because you can see the parallel shadowing is typical of adenomyosis. Sometimes you may see a myometrial cyst, hyperechoic symmetrical nodules, and the earlier sign is an endomyometrial bridging. So normally, when you're doing a 3D scan, you will see the uh, uh, hypoechoic endomyometrial junction, and these are some of the research articles uh, where uh, the endometrium is bridging into the myometrium. That is the earliest sign of uh, adenomyosis. And see here, if you're putting a Doppler on, you will see the vessels actually traversing through the myometrium. Whereas in fibroids, usually it will be circular uh, uh, vasculature around like this. So there's a fibroid, you will see the uh, vessels around. Whereas in adenomyosis, if you put the Doppler on, uh, it is going through the pathology or the adenomyoma or adenomyosis. Intrauterine adhesions is, uh, uh, is a diagnosis uh, generally made by hysteroscopy and history might give us a clue and you've seen the endometrium and it is remaining thin and irregular and in case of bleeding, you may see a bit of blood uh, interspersed and, and if you're putting a saline, you will see the intrauterine adhesions between anterior and posterior wall. And this is further examples of uh, saline infusions from hysterography. And this is an area where we could use an apply ultrasound while doing in a So here, yeah, abdominal ultrasound, you can see the tip of scissors 
and you can uh, see where we need to go in rather than you know uh, uh, rather than perforating the myometria. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, now moving on from the uterus to ovaries, polycystic ovarian syndrome is quite easy to diagnose. See here, there are three different um, morphological um, uh, PCO. See, um, this is quite an enlarged ovary where thick echogenic, uh, echogenic ovarian stroma, whereas in this, there isn't. But having said that, you know, that's the reason why we don't use all the other sub this, but instead you count just the number of follicles and as you're all aware the international um, um, plus international guidance nowadays is if there are more than 20 follicles of 2 to 9 millimeter in one ovary it, it indicates it's a polycystic ovary morphology. You can measure the ovarian volume uh, by measuring the ovary in two diameters, uh, longitudinal and anteroposterior and then you get the ovary in a transverse plane and you measure the transverse diameter and you take that diameter and then it gets automatically. You could apply a 3D, but you don't need a 3D for measuring your ovarian volume. Just the 2D technique is absolutely enough. And there are, these are various um, um, pictures, um, various uh, cysts that we see or come across in women uh, coming for fertility problems. Simple cyst, quite easy, uh, you know, hypoechoic, uh, thin walls. You will see a, a posterior enhancement because of this fluid. And see here, this is, an, uh, this is a hemorrhagic cyst. You can see a reticular pattern of fibrin strands. And this is a, a, a hemorrhagic cyst with a fluid, fluid level. You can see a bit more thick blood and a thin blood. And endometrioma, you will see a homogeneous low level internal echoes. And one thing again, you know, the posterior shadowing is always a sort of a good sign, uh, indicative of more of a benign feature. A dermoid with a normal ovary. So when you're seeing a cyst, always look for whether you can see a normal tissue. And this is a blood of fatty uh, tissue, and that is seen as a hyperechoic. And you can see a bit of calcified area with the posterior shadowing. This is hyperechoic dots and lines because of hair and down view and a linear view. Echogenic floating globules. So there's a globule which is also echogenic. So these are all uh, some of the examples of the dermoid cyst. Hydrosalping is usually seen as a tubular structure with a bit of uh, incomplete septae, uh, and that is mostly because of the mucosal fold or a thickening. Uh, and again, majority of time, it is quite easy to diagnose. And uh, if it is an acute one, you may um, elicit some tenderness. Just last few slides. Ovarian reserve assessment, as I said, it is a concept that has come across over the last 10, 15 years to predict the fertility. And there are quite a few markers that we use ultrasound. And in fact, in our practice, we always use our actual count, and I'm sure many of you are as well. And the um, ample follicle count quite easy to measure where you identify the ovary and you go from one edge of the ovary to the other very slowly and you count all the follicles which uh, are less than 10 millimeter and then you give us uh, give the uh, ample follicle count in that ovary uh, uh, and you repeat exactly the same thing in the other side and have a total um, number. With regard to the ovarian blood flow, um, you could apply a Doppler and then you follow a stromal vessel using a 2D and you get the pulse wave Doppler and you can get all the indices. And if you've got a 3D um, a power Doppler, you could get the overall blood flow within the region of interest and you get a global uh, vascular information within that. But the studies have been shown that antifolic, um, um, sorry, the ovarian volume and ovarian blood flow are superior to antifolic. In fact, antifolic count is the best predictor of ovarian response. So to conclude, um, I've shown you some of the basic uh, sound techniques and principles. So we'll have to familiarize with the machines, buttons, getting the image orientation and get the best quality image by um, um, working on uh, uh, mandatory buttons and things. And we have to be familiar with all the pathologies and, um, and what are the key ultrasound features. Um, and also, uh, I've gone through with you regarding the assessment of ovary and serve and uh, accessibility of the ovary. And thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. That was very, very interesting as usual. And uh, uh, unsurprisingly, Every time that I um, listen to one of your lectures, I learned something. I actually did learn something today. And considering I've been scanning for, I don't even want to, can't even count the number of years, uh, that is always very impressive. So uh, the one thing I did learn today was about uh, adenomyosis being more um, uh, visible in the second part because obviously it becomes brighter. So obviously 
thank you. And uh, we'll obviously have some questions which we're going to take uh, later on. But I think first what we're going to do is just uh, move on with our uh, third uh, talk. Uh, and uh, obviously what um, we're going to hear about is going to be very exciting. But first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Sono, who's obviously uh, a very, very experienced uh, doctor herself. Um, a consultant in gynecology and, uh, and fertility that has a particular interest uh, in ultrasound, um, not just from a research point of view, uh, who's been widely published and especially has a lot of work on ultrasound and uh, PCO, but also uh, in teaching as well, being part uh, of a master's course uh, and uh, all round uh, very, very impressive uh, pedigree and CV all throughout. So obviously we're very excited to um, be uh, having you to, to talk to us um, and uh, I will let you start the um, uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you Bruce, uh, for, for your kind, uh, kind uh, introduction. So after that basic introduction from uh, Jay, we are going to uh, move over to the ultrasound monitoring during the fertility treatment. Uh, we know that we monitor the fertility treatment either by hormonal assays or by combination of the hormonal and the 2D ultrasound, but we also do it by ultrasound and Doppler, and that's how we do it. Uh, Doppler plays a very important part in understanding the reproductive physiology uh, and optimizing the management and the treatment cycle because it is the hormonal changes which convert, I mean, which reflect first as uh, uh, vascular changes, and the vascular changes are best studied by Doppler. So if you can actually interpret the Doppler as well, you can very closely monitor the, the natural cycle or even the, the treatment cycle. Now coming to uh, what we're going to discuss today in, uh, when we're talking about the Doppler or, or about the ultrasound monitoring of the cycle, we're going to discuss four main points. One is to dis use of ultrasound to decide the stimulation protocol. Second is for um, assessing the follicular maturity. Third is for the ass uh, assessment of the endometrial receptivity. And of course, to decide what should be the trigger and what should be the time of IUI and, and such uh, small questions. Uh, there are uh, various studies and various workers have worked on how to decide the stimulation protocols because this is this is one part of the uh, ERT treatment where everybody is uh, a little uh, more worried because if the stimulation protocol is not correct, it's result going to result into either a cancellation of the cycle result because of poor response and on the other end is, is the higher risk of OHSs. Uh, and, and the most common ones used are either using uh, FSH, uh, they are using AMH, they're using the enteral follicle count and age. But um, I believe that uh, when, we, when we use these parameters, we are probably only uh, talking about the result of the ovaries. We are not talking about the response of the ovaries. And to me, there is definitely a difference between the ovarian reserve and the ovarian response though. So reserve tells me how many follicles I'm going to get at the end of stimulation and that depends on the size of the ovaries or the volume of the ovaries and the number of enteral follicles. Whereas when I'm talking about the response it tells me how much doses of gonadotrophins this ovary would require to get stimulated and produce those number of follicles and that depends on the ovarian stromal flows. This is because if the flows to the ovary is more, more percentage of the total gonadotrophins loaded into the patient system is going to flow into the ovaries and therefore less total doses will be required to be put into the patient system. That means if the blood flows to the ovaries are good, patient is a good responder. And on the other side, if the blood flows to the ovaries are less, the patient is a poor responder. So it's very important when we decide the stimulation protocols to look at the ovarian reserve and the response both. Now, starting with the ovarian reserve, Joy has already mentioned that enteral follicle count is one of the best markers to assess the ovarian reserve. Let us, in a few slides, just justify our uh, um, uh, mode of assessing the ovarian reserve by enteral follicle counts. 
It is the number of the small antral follicles which, pre which presents the functional ovarian reserve. Uh, much of it analysis has confirmed that AFC represents the most useful response marker, ovarian response marker to the controlled ovarian stimulation in all study groups as the number of mature oocytes retried increased with the increasing AFC. If we compare this with AMH, which is the most fashionable marker today for the ovarian reserve, the relationship of AMH when it was compared with the other markers of ovarian reserve and AFC, it was concluded that silvene AMH was more robustly correlated with the number of AFC than all the other hormonal markers. For the patients who are uh, suspected of having a poor response, AMH has at least the same level of accuracy and clinical value for the prediction of poor response and non-pregnancy as AFC has been shown in a meta-analysis. And moreover, there's another paper which used a model including AFC and AMH and a model using AFC alone for the prediction of the poor response and both worked almost equally. If you're considering hyper-response, there is a literature evidence which says that AMH and AFC are both accurate predictors of excessive response and AFC can be used safely to decide the stimulation protocol in the hyper-responding patients also. In one of our own studies, we have compared AFC and AMH for, uh, uh, we, we, have, we have correlated AFC and AMH with number of oocytes retrieved and the number of follicles larger than 12 millimeters on the day of trigger because it's a, it, it is expected that all the follicles more than 12 millimeters on the day of trigger can give you fertilized globa in two groups, in the normal group as well as the PCO group. And we found that both proved, both AFC and AMH proved to be almost equally accurate for both the groups for both the end results. That means you can either use AFC or AMH. Otherwise, also going to do an ultrasound, so we prefer to use AFC. As these, the AFC as well as the ovarian volume, are supposed to be the most direct measurements of the ovarian reserve. Moreover, there is a very limited intercycle variability. So it is fairly reliable and can be measured. Jay has already shown beautifully how to count the enteral follicles. And it is his own paper which has shown that whether you measure that uh, or whether you count the enteral follicles with 2D or 3D, it gives identical results. Jay, I, I absolutely agree with you. But yes, when the number of follicles are really too many, as in patients with PCO, so no ABC may be a little time saving and would avoid over on the counting of the follicles when used with post-processing. There's an additional advantage of a sono ABC and that is on its result sheet, it gives you X, Y, Z diameter, mean diameter and the volume of each and every follicle. Yes, it is true that it might not be necessary to, to, to measure the diameter of each and every antral follicles, but as mentioned in Jay's lecture also, it is known that follicles up to 5 or 6 millimeter size are not responsive to FSH and therefore if the stimulation is started early when all the follicles are still smaller than 6 millimeters and then when you assess that patient on the day 5 of stimulation and you don't see a, 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 a dominant follicle, if you think that this ovary is non-responsive or hypo-responsive, probably I think we are we are doing an error because all the follicles when the FSH was started were smaller than six millimeters, these are not going to go to dominance in five days. We might have to wait for a day or two more. So when there are multiple follicles, I do use Sono ABC. Measurement of the ovarian volume, Again, three orthogonal longest diameters is how we, uh, uh, we can measure the size of the ovary and multiplying the three diameter uh, measurements with 0.523 may give us a volume, but it is more accurate to measure the volume with 3D, with vocal, especially in cases of PCO where, where we know that the ovaries may not always be over, they may be as little Longish and sometimes folded on itself. In this cases, 2D measurements might not give us the correct uh, volume calculation. 
So that's about the reserve coming to the response. And uh, uh, there is a literature proof to what I said. If the blood flows to the ovaries are better, the response of the ovary is better. The ovarian stromal flow in the early follicular phase is related to the subsequent ovarian response in the IVF treatment. And all the three 3D power Doppler parameters, the VI, FI, and the VFI, are higher in the patients who respond well. And there's another paper which has already shown that, which has also shown that the FI, stromal FI, is higher in the patients who are higher responder or who have a risk of OHSS and lower in the patients who are poor responders. What is this BIFI and VFI that I'm talking about? These are 3D power Doppler parameters. VI indicates vascularity index and it talks about the abundance of the flow in the entire volume. FI is the flow index, which tells about the average intensity of the flow in the entire volume. And VFI is a composite value of two called vascularity flow index, which tells you about the perfusion. So 3D power Doppler indices are a very sensitive index to tell you about the ovarian response. And even in patients with endometriosis, where you we usually believe that the ovarian response is going to be low to stimulation, um, in these patients also, if the vascularity is good, the response would be better. But that's about the 3D power Doppler. Even the 2D power Doppler parameters, like peak systolic velocity and the res resistance index, RI, are uh, good. Um, uh, they have a very good correlation with the ovarian response and as, as derived from the literature and our experience too, the patients who had an RI of less than 0.58 and a PSV of more than 10 were very good responders. With the normal responders, the RI was between 0.6 and 0.7 and the PSV was between 5 and 10, but for the poor responders, it was the RI was more than 0.7 and the PSV was less than 5 centimeters per second. Now, based on these parameters, well, AFC and volume for the ovarian reserve, um, RI and PSV for the ovarian response. And we know that there are two biometric parameters which are really, really sensitive for the decision on the amount of uh, gonadotropins required to stimulate the ovaries, the age, and the BMI. We have done several pilot studies on that. And uh, this was the paper uh, where we, we, we derived a baseline scoring system to simplify, to decide the stimulation protocols. If you look at the scoring system, the lower scores tend for all, all those parameters which demand higher doses for stimulation, whereas the higher score for those parameters which indicate the patient is a high responder and the patients would require lower doses for stimulation. That means if the total score of the patient on the baseline scan is low, she would require lower doses for stimulation. And if it is high, she would require higher doses for stimulation. And based on this, we have derived the starting dose protocol for it. So depending on the score, we would decide what would be the starting dose and this is for RFSH. The study uh, which was published was about uh, 1,517 patients, 70 patients for IUI and uh, 350 patients for IVF, but we still use this, the same protocol and we have completed more than about 5,600 uh, cycles of the, the gonadotropin stimulation, IUI and IVF. And we believe this is a very reliable protocol because we have an extremely low mild to moderate OHSS uh, rate. We have zero severe OHSS and we don't have to usually cancel cycles because of the poor response. Now, when we start with the stimulation, we know that on day five or six, when we do a scan, if you get a follicle of 10 millimeters, that means this follicle has grown to dominance and the drug is responding well. But if you are doing an IUI cycle and the patient uh, does not show any response, the first thing is, when do I say the patient does not show any response? One. The follicle is not grown beyond 10 millimeters. And two, the endometrium is also not growing. If one of the two is growing, that means the patient is responding because even in the absence of follicular growth, the endometrium is growing because the estrogen level is rising. That means the granulosa cells are proliferating, though the follicle size is not increasing, which will increase in the course of time. It is in these cases that depending on the score, uh, we would 
decide how much gonadotrophin to increase, for example, score less than 10, increase 75 international units on day 5 of stimulation between 10 and 20. You can increase 37.5 to 75 international units on day 7, not on day 5. When the score increases, this is the PCO group, when you don't increase the dose to day 10 or day 14 of stimulation, and you increase the dose very slowly, that means they actually match with the chronic low dose protocols. In the IVF, it's only in the low score group that if the patient does not respond, we add LH or HMG in this patient. And there is a valid reason for this. If the patient has a very low score, that means not only her AFC and volume are low, her vascularity parameters are also low. That means she has a high RI and a low PSV. And it has been seen that it is LH which is responsible for the stromal vascularization due to neoangiogenesis, catecholinergic stimulation, and leukocytal and cytomine activation. That means that if the patient has a good ovarian flow, that means she is going to respond well, but it also means that she has a normal or high levels of LH, and therefore in this patient's LH, supplementation may not be required. But if the ovarian stromal flow is less, which means that the patient is a poor responder, in this cases, there is either a low LH level or LH has a low bioactivity or there's a polymorphism in this LH which is not perceived by the OTs. It is in these patients that you require to supplement LH for stimulation. And this exactly matches to what is seen, what is said for the Poseidon group 1 and 2. You have normal ovarian reserve parameters, but the patient has not responded well. And therefore, you add LH. In this cases, the response parameters, the blood flows are not included. If they had been included, probably even at the start of the stimulation, we would have known that this patients would require uh, um, LH for their uh, stimulation. Uh, then coming to the assessment of the follicular maturity, uh, of course, we all know that when the follicle reaches a size of 16 to 18 millimeter, we call it a mature follicle. And of course, we would look for total anechogenicity inside the lumen, thin walls, which tell us an irregular round or an oval shape, which tells us it is a good quality follicle. But about 24 to 36 hours before the, the ovulation occurs, you are going to see a hypoechoic halo surrounding the follicle and you'll also see a tiny solid projection from the wall of the follicle which is a cumulus. Uh, these two things appear about 24 to 36 hours before the ovulation occurs and it is about 6 to 10 hours before the ovulation that you'll see some low label echoes parallel to the follicular wall. And this tells you that this is an impending ovulation, it's probably because of the separation of the innermost layer of the follicle to allow the release of the uh, of the uh, oocyte cumulus complex. Uh, apart from this, it is important to document that the dominance of the follicle starts with the increase in the vascular. It starts pulling the blood vessels towards itself, and this blood vessels reach maximum just before the the, the surge starts, that means this blood vessels, when they surround at least two-thirds, preferably three-fourths of the follicular circumference and has a low RI of less than 0.5 and appears with more than 10 centimeters per second, seconds, it tells me that this follicle is a mature follicle, functionally mature follicle, not just anatomically. And that assessment is very, very important because it is the follicle's more uniform very vascular, very follicular network, vascular network, which gives us a better pregnancy rate. This can be better evaluated by 3D ultrasound also. You may use what is called a vocal software. And even uh, subjectively, you can see that the vascularity of the follicle is good. You can also objectively measure it by the same BIFI and BFI parameters using volume histogram after the vocal is done. And it is seen that with Particular VI and the FI values, the pink bars which show the pregnancies are higher. That means you get better pregnancy rates if you have particular VI and FI values. Uh, of course, you would not add that every time, but Doppler is absolutely essential. What we do is when we get three cycles, fail, uh, failed cycles, 
even after we have taken a decision for trigger with Dopplers, that's when we start applying 3Ds and 3D power Dopplers. Oocytes from very hypoxic follicles have a high frequency of or, uh, abnormalities of the organization of the chromosomes on the metaphor spindle. That means if you have less blood flow in the follicle, that means you have hypoxic oocytes and these are the the, the oocytes which are going to result into chromosomally abnormal embryos and therefore we do not give a trigger till the follicular vascularity is good. Coming to the endometrial receptivity assessment, we know that as estrogen level rises, the endometrial morphology changes from triple line thin endometrium to a thicker uh, uh, triple line endometrium. Uh, the triple line endometrium can be graded uh, according to the Smith uh, et al. grading system into three uh, different grades. That is grade B, where you have a multi layer endometrium with almost uh, anechoic or hypoechoic intervening areas. You have a grade A endometrium, which is multi layered with echogenesis in between, which is not more than that of the anterior myometrium, and the triple layer pattern is still maintained. And the third grade C is an isoechoic endometrium. It's very interesting to understand that as the, the estrogen level increases, the endometrial morphology changes from that to that, and it is grade B endometrium, which is usually achieved when you have estrogen levels um, uh, uh, equal to about one or two mature follicles. <clears throat> Whereas when you have three or four, you usually get a grade A endometrium, and when it is multiple follicular development you have a grade C endometrium so it's not always necessary that the endometrium is going to pass through the entire hierarchy it may the follicle may rupture with that or with that endometrium it was earlier thought it was this endometrium which was not good for implantation but there are several studies which have shown that the vascularity studies are more important than the morphology but it is important also to understand that it is the endometrial morphology which indirectly tells you about the follicular quality because if you have multiple follicles but you still have a grade B endometrium, that means none of these follicles are producing sufficient estrogen to convert that endometrium from grade B to grade A. Or similarly, you have just two or three follicles but you have nice grade A endometrium, that means they all are good functionally, they are producing good levels of estrogen. It is the same estrogen which is responsible for the angiogenic effect and this blood vessels, they start growing from the periphery. We know that they are, they are uh, branches of spiral vessels. And if they are reaching only great, uh, or, or the endomyoid junction, we call it zone one vascularity. If they touch the high, outer hyperechoic line, it is zone two. If they come to the intervening area, it is zone three. And if they touch the central line, it is zone four vascularity. And this classification is given by Applebaum et al. And it is zone 3 and zone 4 vascularity, which is essential for the implantation to occur. These vessels must have a low um, uh, resistance with an RI of less than 0.6. But if uh, the endometrium, five, at least 5 millimeters square of its area, is not vascularized in zone 3 and zone 4, then the chances of implantation are extremely, extremely low because that is the minimum area required of. Uh, for, for the implanting embryo to get uh, actually buried in and, and start growing. This vascularity, as I told you, is more important than the morphology and thickness. Of course, thickness minimum is 6 to 7 millimeter, but beyond that, it is more important to, uh, to see the vascularity. And if the vascularity is not present, it's a strong predictor of failure of implantation. If the implantation occurs, the chances of abortions are significantly high. This has been shown in various studies, but it has also been shown in one of our studies where when the vascularity was present in zone 3 and 4, not only the implantation rates were high, the abortion rates were significantly, significantly low. If I say so and insist so much on the vascularity, I know there's somebody who would say that the Cochrane does not agree with this. The Cochrane says that the vascularity cannot be entirely correlated with the implantation rates and that's absolutely true because the implantation is a combined function of the endometrium and the embryo. So if you cannot evaluate the embryo quality, it is best to look at the endometrium and get it to the best, which is by the vascularity or get to the endometrial, uh, get the endometrial receptivity to the best so that the implantation rates may improve. Therefore, it's important to look at the vascularity. And these parameters are important for 
IUI and fresh embryo transfer cycles before the trigger. If you are going to do a frozen transfer, it's important to look for them before the progesterone is started. In some cases, endometrial evaluation by 3D is important, especially the endometrial volume. In those cases, especially where you have a very thin endometrium or a very thick endometrium with unexplained failure of implantation, it is important to understand that the minimum endometrial volume required is uh, in different studies as 2 ml to 3 ml. With our studies, it's 3 ml, but there are a stud there is a study which indicates minimum 2 ml is required. Now, if the endometrium is thin, but the uterus is long, the volume may reach 2 ml. Or if the endometrium is thick, but the uterus is short, the volume may not reach 2 ml in spite of the endometrial thickness of 8 millimeters. So, where you have unexplained failures of implantation, the, the 3D assessment is absolutely required. It is this studies which have also shown that whether it's a VI or FI, these parameters are also important. And if these parameters are higher, then the chances of implantation are better. That means if the vascularity is better, the chances of implantation is better. Apart from that, it's also important to look at the uterine artery PI before the trigger. And if it's less than 3.2 only, then you would give a trigger. A very important point is about the concern for the raised, raised progesterone before the trigger or, <clears throat> uh, or before starting the progesterone actually. And that 1.5 nanogram has created a lot of noise in the entire reproductive medicine uh, uh, um, treatment. Uh, what I would uh, think is that instead of that 1.5 ml, what is probably a nanogram, what is important is that the progesterone is affecting the endometrium negatively or not. We know that progesterone actually starts rising before the ovulation occurs. And that rise in progesterone, as long as it is just early, as long as it, the label is physiological, you will only get a fluffy outer margin of the endometrium. So before you start, before you are going to give a trigger or, the, or, or before you do an IY, if you are seeing that the endometrium is just a fluffy margin, it is absolutely, absolutely normal and expected and good for uh, receptivity. But if you see that the outer margin of the endometrium has started becoming hyperechoic, it says that either the progesterone exposure is for a longer duration or the levels are very high and this affects the endometrium negatively. So you can also, without measuring progesterone, know that the progesterone is within physiological limits or not. That means that when I give it the trigger, the endometrium is going to be multilayered. When, if I do a transfer on day three and I'm seeing the endometrium, it will have a mildly hyperechoic and a fluffy margin. And if I see on day five, the entire endometrium almost will be hyperechoic. Different days will give you different pictures. So you cannot say on the day of transfer, this should be the endometrium. Similarly, for the vascularity, on the trigger day, the vascularity is maximum. On day three, transfer it is less. Whereas on day five, transfer it is more. Uh, decision on the trigger agent, we all know that when there are multiple follicles, we are now planning for either pure agonist trigger or we are planning for a dual trigger. And for that, we need to see that there are multiple follicles and what are the sizes and that is where the, the sonar ABC is definitely helpful and that charge tells us actually how many follicles are larger than 11 millimeters or smaller than 11 millimeters. Just a last word on the timing of IUI or single or a double IUI. It's very important to understand that once the surge starts with the rise in the LH level, the PSV of the follicle also rises. And therefore, close to ovulation, the PSV reaches as high as 40 to 45 centimeters per second. That means if I'm doing a pre-trigger scan and the PSV of the follicle is not 10 with a low RI, it is something like 20, 22, 25, 30, that means I'm somewhere here on the surge. In this case, his ovulation is going to occur early and therefore we suggest according to our studies that whenever the PSV is more than 20, you must do two IUIs or an earlier IUI, 12 to 14 hours and 36 to 38 hours after the trigger. That means understanding the follicular and endometrial dynamics during the cycle is the key to the good monitoring of the treatment and better results. And Doppler plays a very, very important role for the same. Thank you very much. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that uh, fascinating uh, uh, lecture. So now, obviously, uh, we've come to the end of the, um, uh, the three lectures, uh, three uh, different lectures, very different, but I hope very stimulating to all. Um, and uh, I just wanted to also thank all the delegates. We've had over um, 400 uh, uh, people that have joined to listen to these lectures. So thank you all very much. I know we're coming towards the end of the allocated time, but I think um, we can uh, extend maybe a little bit just to have some questions. Um, so I've got uh, a few questions that have come through. So uh, if that's okay, I'm just going to start straight away and then uh, uh, either um, Dr. Sun or Dr. Jay can answer the ultrasound ones, anything relevant to me, obviously I'll answer. So I'll start with the first one. And uh, very quickly, I think actually that's particularly as to Dr. Jay is, can you just explain again um, the focal point and the angle in a transvaginal uh, scan? Okay, the, the scan angle is basically that, you know, if you're coming into a, a room, yeah, and you are having an overview, you know, of the contents in the room. And so the scan angle, basically that we always keep it as wide as possible to begin with. And so that you will have a panoramic view of the pelvic structures. So if you're doing a transvaginal scan. So that is why I said about scan angle, generally, you know, we have the machines which uses up to 120 degree or some machines which even have 180 degrees. So that means, you know, that scan angle will be much wider. And if you're, but with the, if, if the scan angle is wide, one of the problem is you always have a better axial resolution. That means the image quality will be much better right in the middle of that uh, scan, you know, in, uh, around 90 degrees, you know, like vertical line. Whereas the lateral resolution, that means the structures on, on the sides won't be as clear as in the center. So that is why you have to work with the scan angle. So you always start with the wide scan angle. And then once you see the structure that you want to focus, then you reduce the scan angle so that the ultrasound waves won't be dispersed and it will be more focused onto that area and therefore the resolution, the image quality will be better. So that is what is scan angle. And um, along with it, obviously you'll have to increase the depth as well. That is why I said about always when we are looking at the image, make sure that you're increasing the depth so that the uh, structure will be magnified uh, and it will be occupying more or less two third or more than two third of the screen. And with regard to the focal point, the focal point, you remember that, you know, it's like a con, you know, like a concave lens. So it's like a focus. The focal point will be where the narrowest of a concave lens, narrowest point that is in the middle. And that is where the resolution will be the best. So that is why when you're keeping the focal point to the structure that you want specifically to focus, you keep the focal point at that level. So, for example, if you're assessing endometrium, as Sonal was saying about you know, you have to look at, if you want to look at even the finer details about the echogenicity between those three lines, between those two lines as well, you keep the focal point right at the level of the endometrium or just below. So then the resolution will be better at that level. And uh, uh, if uh, Sonal wants to ask because she is the ultrasound guru. No, no, <laughs> Jay, you're perfect. <laughs> So actually, the next question is uh, now that we mentioned it for uh, for Sonal as well. So one of the questions it's uh, presume it's not so much ultrasound, but maybe ultrasound and treatment as well. And it was the question about uh, the lining. And let me see if I can summarize this. But effectively, if the lining is thin, compared, but you still have the follicles and everything, what what do you do? Uh, I presume the question is in the context of not an abnormal uterus like adhesion, but in the context of uh, So, um, if, if what do you do to improve it? If you if you say that the endometrium is thin, how thin is thin? Uh, we believe that anything more than six, if it has a good vascularity, it is a good endometrium. The another important point is that if you say that the the endometrium is good in spite of uh, normal follicles or good follicles. Unless I have checked the vascularity of the follicles, I'll not say that the follicle is mature. So there's a difference between the functional maturity and the anatomical maturity. And if along with good follicle size and vascularity, you are still not getting the endometrium, which is thicker than six to seven millimeters, then 
If the PSV of the follicle is still less than 10, you can wait for a day. Continue with the gonadotropin stimulation and within a day or so, you'll see there is an increase in the, in the endometrial thickness by 0.345 millimeters and it may be, it may be just sufficient for the uh, trigger. If you're talking about CC cycles, in these cases, you might have to wait for the follicle to grow to as 24, 25 millimeters. And only then you will get a vascularity. And when you get a vascularity, you will get a good endometrium. In the other cases, there are a lot of, I think we can take an entire lecture on the thin endometrium and how to deal with it. So I'm not going to talk on the treatment part. Uh, yes, no, I agree. That's an entire lecture itself. I think it was the vascularity that was the main question that uh, needed to be answered. And uh, going on to the next one, and I think that's uh, actually for either of those, um, uh, I think an issue was for uh, Dr. J, is what is the um, differential diagnosis of a dilated tubular structure in the adnexa and how to differentiate? So now who wants to answer uh, that one? Uh, I'll start and then Samali can. <laughs> sure, come on. <laughs> the, 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 obviously, the, um, you know, the, the adnexal uh, tubal structure, that one thing that, of course, that you need to be, bear in mind of hydrostalpings. So with the hydrostalpings, you will see a sort of a tube, uh, tubular, dilated, filled with fluid. And it will be probably C-shaped or S-shaped because it is always curved. And you will see that structure between the uterus and between the ovary. And if you're looking at, you know, different cross sections and things, you might be able to see like, uh, you know, thin, uh, the uh, incomplete septae. And that is mainly either due to the fold or maybe even mucosal thickening inside. Sometimes you may feel a bit of beaded appearance because of inside the scar tissues and therefore you will be seeing as sort of uh, hyperechoic nodules. The other thing that you want to uh, uh, rule out, or in fact, you know, many a times that we see a curry hydrosalpins is a paratubal or para ovarian cyst, mainly the paratubal cyst, you know, and when you do the laparoscopy as well, you will be able, you will see that, like um, uh, from the, uh, uh, the residual glands that could be dilated and that forms a cyst. But generally, when you're looking at that, uh, you know, if you're having a cross section um, or if you're turning the probe, uh, you know, angling or having a cross, having a, a transverse plane or a longitudinal plane, you will always see that as a cyst, not like a tubular. And that is a sort of a differential diagnosis of paratubal cyst. Um, is there anything else that you want to write, Sonal? Uh In fact, I think they are talking about any, any uh, lumen, I mean, any uh, structure which has fluid and which has and so usually what we say, I mean, which, which is in the adnexa or which looks like it's in the adnexa. So you, you're absolutely right. Anything that is extra ovarian. So you have to first prove that it's extra ovarian by either your spreading organ sign or by the beak or the dream sign uh, of the ovary. So that tells you it's extra ovarian. Once it's extra ovarian, if it rotates, if you rotate your probe and it changes its shape, elongates, whether it becomes C or not, but sometimes it happens that there are adhesions and in between there's a fluid collection. So if it elongates, it is still, you suspect it is a hydrosalpins. Your differential diagnosis usually would be either a bubble or a vessel because they both will also show either um, elongation and on the rotation of the probe and they're both extra ovarian. And we know that it's peristalsis which differentiates bubble from the, uh, from the tube and uh, it's Doppler which shows blood flows in the vessel and from the hydrosalpics again. And of course, the fourth uh, that you have given is a paratubal cyst, absolutely correct. And uh, the next question actually, and I think um, I could be again for either, is the specs, it goes specs of a calcification in the endometrium. So sometimes you see specs of calcification and how to interpret them. I presume we're not referring to big sort of uh, white areas that could be uh, previous scar tissue, but just small little specks that you can see occasionally in the endometrium. And uh, how would you interpret those? Jay, you want to? So, uh, if you want me to? Okay. Yeah. So a tiny flecks of calcification in the endometrium. Uh, you have to first consult, confirm it's a calcification because many a times it happens that there are, the patient may have adenomasis and you have uh, 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 collapsed uh, myometrial cyst in the subendometrium, which may feel like endometrial calcifications. So you first confirm with the posterior shadowing that truly calcifications. 
If they are truly calcifications, it may be any of the chronic endometritis. Rarely, very rarely, with the um, curatage, post curatage, I have seen a few flakes of calcification. They're hardly one, two, not multiple. That's that's what I have seen. Jay, you want to add something? No, I completely agree. I mean, many times that I've seen this and I've gone in with the hysteroscope, couldn't see anything, to be honest. Um, the scar tissues will be seen as a white uh, plaques, but um, the Kustin, whoever has raised it, uh, themselves have said not to, you know, not about scars. And the other thing is, of course, that you know, if somebody has had a, 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 a termination or maybe whether, you know, ruling out fetal bones or that kind of thing, but usually that will be very long and it is easily identifiable. I mean, the other area of calcifications that you tend to see quite frequently is if uh, somebody had a previous delivery and is where the placental bed used to be, and you tend to see them at the uh, interface of the endometrium, the myometrium, uh, and it's just on the side of the placental. So very frequently, I just kind of ask, um, obviously, you know from the history, hopefully, before you scan somebody, they've actually had a previous delivery, and you say, oh, was it an anterior or posterior placental? And I have to admit, pretty much every time you get it right. So that's another sort of thing, but that's not really in the endometrium. It's more sort of at the at the interface, and you occasionally see that. Now, I don't see it all the times, but I do see it quite frequently as well. So that could be another sort of differential uh, sort of diagnosis as well. Um, I think there's one more question, uh, and I think it's for me, and it has to do with the filters of my uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, air handling unit, and if we have um, UVC. So I think, I mean, I was just an, it was just an example of what we have. Actually, we have a very complex um, air handling system with a very uh, 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 expensive filtering system called uh, uh, Life Fair. It's actually an American system. Um, which has uh, lots and lots and lots of filters and uh, yes, 42 carbon permanganate filter and all the rest. Um, and it's the only one in the UK and I think actually it might be the only one in Europe. Uh, it's only a year old since we got it and all the top units in uh, the US have it. And the idea is that uh, it effectively gets the air to be um, VOC, pretty much VOC free. So we have something like 0 0.00000 something 1% of VOCs. The idea is that VOCs actually, so volatile um, organic compounds uh, are not good for embryos. And that's why I said that the background of the air that we have in our unit is actually pretty much close to um, to class A. That's not because we wanted it, it just sort of came out. That's not the requirement. But interestingly, there are uh, systems where you can use UV light and actually UV is being used uh, now to kill off viruses and uh, and, and for cleaning in general, actually, uh, I know I'm transgressing, but I'm going to come to the ultrasound. We've just um, got, uh, or just signed on the dotted line for a contract to get, anyway, uh, a cleaning system. It's a French system, which actually uh, for probes, for endocavity probes, and it relies on ultrasound. So instead of using um, um, a chemicals, um, and there are various chemicals out there in the UK specifically, the most commonly used is the trophin system, there's also Tristel and stuff like that. This actually has no chemicals and it basically has UV lamps and it's a big box and you put your probe in, you press the button, it's 90 seconds um, uh, and it comes out and it's been validated to pretty much kill all viruses, HPV and the rest. So actually UV light um, uh, both in the lab and in ultrasound cleaning uh, is a very um, a valid way of, of, of killing off and, and sterilizing uh, equipment, bacteria. And completely randomly and interestingly, I was chatting to somebody uh, about it yesterday or two days ago, and they're actually bringing almost like a UV wand now for uh, potentially for restaurants, areas. They can actually use it and put equipment underneath, and I think it has a six-hour um uh, sort of life cycle where effectively the idea is that it sterilizes or uh, and kills off coronavirus and everything else in, a, in an environment um, so to, to use it more for um, uh, catering areas so uh, I'm not sure if I answered the question I have to be honest but I'm just bringing everything together so the, the point of it I guess what we're trying to make is you just need to know what your system does and what it can actually um, a kill or not and then you can actually figure out how safe you are. And that's a general requirement, not just for this time. But interestingly, how a lot of this technology is now coming to ultrasound as well and, and uh, um, how we can use it sort of in everyday practice. So I hope that answered that question. Um, so um, 
I think we've sort of now, it's uh, quarter past uh, the time that we're uh, 15 extra minutes from what we said. I think that uh, uh, pretty much uh, is um, uh, a good conclusion. We've wrapped it together. Three uh, lectures, three interesting. Um, uh, uh, I have one last question that I'll take that just popped up, and then that'll be the last one. Uh, and the question is, says, when the endometrium and the growth of the follicle is not synchronous, what will be the picture in 2D and 3D? Please explain. Uh, 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 I was for Sonal, actually. How do you... How do you rectify that? I think we sort of answered that question, but maybe slightly different as well. So now we're talking about discordant endometrium and follicles. How do we rectify it? If it is an IVF cycle, the best way, if there's not a synchronization, to do a segmentation of IVF. That means you can do frozen transfers later on. The question comes when it's an IUI cycle, or you have definitely planned a fresh transfer. Again, as long as it's a fresh transfer IVF, it is not much of a problem because we know that we, the patient is on uh, uh, down regulation, either agonist or antagonist. And in these cases, you can comfortably take the follicles forward. And especially if uh, you, uh, you have one or two follicles which have overgrown, there you have a more larger uh, following cohorts, you can definitely do, disregard those follicles, allow the other follicles to grow in the meantime, then metric will come. The most difficult part is when it's an IUI because there the patient is not down regulated and you cannot take a, a risk because the follicles may rupture. What usually we do with those IUI cycles where there's not a synchronization between the endometrium and the follicles, that means the endometrium is lagging behind. As I told you earlier, we, we do continuous stimulation for a day or two and try for the uh, endometrium to grow to better. If that is not the case, we would explain the patient that, look, the follicle is likely to rupture, the endometrium is thin or is not showing vascularity, the chances of implantation are less. But if we don't take an action, the follicle is going to rupture and we'll lose the cycle. So there are two options for them. You can either go for a trigger and a timed intercourse. You can do take a trigger and do an IUI and take what maximum chance you have. Or you can just forget to take a trigger and just have an intercourse for two, three, four days. Over the time, we would do a follow up and that's it. Thank you. Uh, and actually, I just have a little rectification to my answer because I just uh, confirmed with my lab manager. Uh, yes, we actually do also have the UV uh, uh, filter in our, uh, um, our handling unit. And yes, we do have 42 carbon permanganate filters in our air handling unit. Uh, so yes to all of that. But as I said, our system is quite unique. So that's why you just need to know your own system. So yes, yeah, slight clarification there. Um, that aside, I think I think that's all the question all the time. I think we're going to stop there. I want to thank um, all the delegates for joining. And uh, I'm just going to let uh, Dr. J just sort of close uh, the session since you opened it uh, again as well. And obviously from my point of view, I'd like to thank uh, everybody and my uh, two sort of colleagues for talking. And uh, uh, yes, Jay, it's up to you. Yeah, um, thank you, Paul. Thank you for moderating uh, the session very nicely and giving a, a good overview about uh, COVID testing and then subsequently you know, even running a unit in this difficult time, you know, uh, as safe as possible. Uh, and also, Sonal, uh, thank you very much, you know, for um, taking into a bit more advanced, you know, 3D and application of Doppler in day-to-day -day practice. And in fact, you yourself have uh, published a lot on, on the topic and given quite a lot of practical considerations. And I would like to uh, obviously thank uh, delegates, you know, uh, uh, IPO has uh, thanked as well. And in addition, the key... Uh, uh, members, you know, the Made in It Bharat, uh, thank you for organizing this, and also Alex Vergis of uh, Life, Life in Vitro Academy for making uh, this happen. Uh, and I think uh, probably we have had an extended session, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. We can close the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.